Ah, oh, today's the day. Better late than never. What I'm never up? late. I'm never late. Let's go, chest. Come on, let's hit. All right, we have we have leg day, okay? Okay, fine. We're gonna hit legs. I just need an energy drink. Let's go to vitamin shop. Easy, right across the street. Yeah, Jim Weed is at every single vitamin shop starting now, so. Let's go. You're wasting my time. Let's, Come on, go. let's go. Perfect, my favorite. Give me the pineapple. Give me the pineapple. No, I don't. Give me the pineapple. Please. Perfect. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Vitamin shop. Go check it out. Nationwide, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Here we yeah. go. Yeah. Here we go. I was, I was so. <laughs> no, honestly, I, 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 I told. I believe you're natty. I do. It's good to know. <laughs> there, but there was there was times when I'm like, nah, because because they'd see you competition. I'm like, ah, oh, come on, dude. Like, but I believe it. I believe it. Um, well, and you were. So did you did you find me when I was like still mostly in bodybuilding? Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. would have been like late 2000s, 2010 time period. Yes, that's, that's when I first started, like, kind of really getting into social media. Like, literally had started in the beginning of Instagram. Um. I think I knew about you before, like social media. Yeah, I, yeah. I was would, on the bodybuilding.com forums, forums and stuff. And shit. Yeah. Were you ever on T Nation? No, but they talk about me a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I, how did you get started in all this like science stuff and understanding? Like, did you did you go to school for it? Were you self taught? Like, um. So, because you're a huge nerd, huge nerd, which is dope. Yeah, uh, I always describe myself as either. A nerd who likes to lift heavy shit or a meathead who loves science. So you one. pick pick one, right? Um, so I got I got into lifting because I got bullied a lot like growing up. Um, bullied a lot, didn't get much attention from girls. So I was like, all right, I'll start lifting. Lifting didn't really solve either of those two problems. Yeah, mostly but dudes. Yeah, mostly dudes. I think I've seen lifting. a meme where it's like, yeah. what dudes expect to happen when they start lifting? And it's like, you know, a chick hanging all over a yeah. guy. And then it's like, what actually happens? And it's, it's a, bunch a bunch of dudes, dudes like, nice buys, bro. Yeah, how much you know? bench? <laughs> Classic. And everyone's and like, how do I get fucking this? Yeah. And how do I get that? It's funny. Um, so I, I started lifting for that. Fell in love with lifting. I originally wanted to go to college for marine science. I wanted to study sharks. I love sharks. <laughs> I know. Like, oh, random. Fuck. Random. So you went to college for marine science? Well, I, I wanted to. I went to... So I... Wanted to go to Eckerd College in St. Pete, Florida. I'm originally from Indiana. Okay. And, but at that point, like age 18, I was really getting into lifting. So I was like, ah, oh, I don't really know what I want to do. So I went broad to start. So I went with biochemistry because I'm like, all right, if I want to still want to do marine science, I can take electives and then do that in grad school. Um, but I had no idea what I really wanted to do because after I did my first bodybuilding show, I was 19 years old, 2001, dating myself now. Yeah. And so crazy. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a bit. Time flies. It does, dude. Yeah. Um, so after that, I was like, uh, I won the teen class. I won the novice class. And I was like hooked. You know, yeah. I'm like, I want to do something like this for my life. Yeah. But like natural bodybuilding, there's no money in it, you know. Yeah. And there's no money in bodybuilding, really. Period. You know. Yeah. Unless you're um, at the top of the game, you know how to leverage yeah, the branding. I mean, you're, you're. Yeah, and even then, like, if you're one of the top competitors, you're not making money. I mean, you make money from winning shows, but that's not where the bulk of your income is coming from. No, you got to uh, learn how to leverage social media at this exactly. point. Otherwise, you're f f especially bodybuilding. Yeah, exactly. Because the amount of money it takes to be at that level and, like, stuff you got to do for your health and all this shit, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a so. lot. So I was like, okay. Uh, I was getting, like, my junior year. I was doing a degree in biochemistry. Loved it because I'm learning about the human body and everything I'm learning. I'm trying to relate to how do I get jacked and shredded, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, got to junior year and I'm like, man, I, I like at the time, this is like 2003. I mean, to make money in the fitness industry, you kind of had like four choices. Um, go try to be Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Uh, and get sponsored by a supplement company. Start your own supplement company. Open a gym or be a PT. Yeah. Those are kind of your choices, right? And I'm like, you know... I didn't come from money and I had no, I had no idea about how to like raise capital and stuff. Yeah. And then the idea of being a PT on the gym floor all day didn't really appeal to me. So I'm like, ah, oh, damn. I was like, well, let's look at grad school. I'll go to grad school, get a master's or a PhD. And hopefully I won't be in the unemployment line. You know, maybe I'll figure it out while I'm there. And so I looked around for different programs, ended up settling on university of Illinois. How are you funding all this without having making, like, how are you making money to fund this? 
To go to grad school? Yeah. So I actually got paid to go to grad school. So when you well, do... how do you get paid to go to grad school? So when you... Do, in, in the sciences, in the hard sciences, if you're conducting research, not always, but typically, especially at big universities and good programs in Illinois, at the time, I think it was ranked number two for nutritional science yeah. in the country. Um, and was really... I went to a really well-funded lab. So as part of... Um, like when they write grants and whatnot... They write in funding for the students. But you have to be smart enough to get this funding. Like you have to be considered some sort of. I mean, they're not. Hopefully, if they're a good program, they're not going to bring in, you know, candidates that aren't worth a crap. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so basically, like as a Ph.D. student doing research, they don't want you having another job, really, because you're spending so much time in lab. It'd be tough. Now, some students, they get what's called teaching assistantships where they're like teaching some, some classes for undergrads, you yeah. know, to help the professor. I see. Um, I was lucky enough that I got a fellowship, um, which was a higher paying entry. So I got a fellowship for three years and then a research assistantship for three years. So the fellowship paid me like $22,000 a year. Um, and then the research assistantship was like $15,000 a year. So it wasn't a lot of money, but my tuition was waived. And so yeah. like I could, you know, I could focus on that. So I'm going to go to grad school. I wanted to study protein metabolism because I was, you know, bodybuilder Hell into yeah. protein, yeah. you know, build muscle. And, uh, Don Lehman, who was my PhD advisor, he was like, I just went to PubMed. PubMed was really new at the time. Cause I was like going to all these different schools, trying to find like an advisor who was studying something I was interested in. Cause you really, when you go to grad school, you want to pick your advisor. Cause if you pick an advisor, who's not doing anything you're interested in, you're just going to end up doing his shit. Whatever he's doing. Or yeah. their shit, you know, because yeah. females too. Um, or, or unless you can convince them that your stuff's more interesting than their stuff, you know? Yeah. So I would like go to like all these different big state schools trying to find, and I'm like, man, it's taking forever. And then PubMed had just come out like a couple years earlier. And I'm like, what if I just go search what I'm interested in and see who's publishing the research? When did PubMed start? <sighs> I can't remember. I feel right. like everyone references that. Early 2000s, probably. Holy shit. Um, so I just typed in what I was interested in, leucine skeletal muscle protein synthesis, and Don Lehman's paper was the first one that, or second one that popped up. The first one that popped up was from a guy named Tipton, who um, I emailed, but he wasn't taking grad students. And then uh, Lehman was second. He was like, yeah, I've got some openings. You know, you sound like you're well qualified. So, so what sort of research do you start to go do? So... He was looking kind of specifically, so he had some human trials and then we had more like mechanistic data that he was looking at, like in terms of, okay, it seems like this amino acid leucine is important for muscle protein synthesis. We have a lot of mechanistic data showing that if you give leucine, it increases muscle protein synthesis. But as a part of like whole diets or complete protein sources, does it actually matter, right? That was kind of one of the questions that he had. And so when I came in, we talked about the research he was doing, where he thought I could fit in. And I was very interested in that question as well. And so, for example, like I would say the best study I did or the one I'm most proud of yeah. is we fed like different level, different types of protein. And these are lab rats, right? right. But rat is actually a very good model for human protein metabolism. And our results got validated in humans later. We fed uh, wheat, soy, egg, and whey. But same calories, same total protein, and we looked at, all right, is there a difference in like protein synthesis and actually like muscle mass as well? We did a longer term study and we we're actually able to show that like, yes, muscle protein synthesis was different and it was mostly based off the leucine contents of those different protein sources. So the, the takeaway was, you know, it's not just the bioavailability of a protein or another measure is what's called PD cause. Yeah. Um, it's also the leucine content of the protein makes a difference in terms of like how anabolic it is to muscle tissue. And even so like, is it safe to say like if you ate like a meal and then followed it up with some leucine, it'd be better. It'd be more efficient for building muscle. Yeah. I mean you could, but I, I mean, if you're a body, but like I tell people, if you're eating like, you know, one gram per pound of body weight, kind of the old it's school, it, you don't need an extra on top of it. What like, if you're like super trying to be try hard and like get lean and like maintain muscle mass? Is that when it matters more? You know, I, I the, the research on supplemental leucine it just doesn't really seem to show anything because mostly it, unless you're like low protein and then it probably helps. But if you're getting in enough protein, it's, it, it seems to not really make a difference. So overall, 
So, so this, I, cause I, I wanted to talk to you about, but this it does, stuff. it does. Let me, let me put a caveat yeah, there. It does make a difference in terms of like, so let's take like a people doing a plant-based diet, right? Um, one aspect of that is now you can build as much muscle on a plant-based diet as you can on a, on a omnivore diet. You just got to pay a little more attention to your, your sources. Yeah, yeah. Because one, the, the protein in plant material is bound up in the fibrous material of the plant, like the intact plant sources. Yeah. So let's say you're eating like beans or legumes or whatnot. And then they can have a decent amount of protein, like 16 grams. Um, but it's only about 70, 80% bioavailable because it's, bound up in that fibrous material and not accessible to some of your digestive enzymes. And it tends to be lower in essential amino acids and leucine. So what I tell people is if you're plant-based, you know, you probably need, you know, an extra 10, 20% protein total to get kind of the same amount of high quality protein As that you'd get based. if if you were like omnivore. Yeah. Okay. And you can do it, but I think most, you know, vegans, if they're looking to build muscle, would do well to kind of supplement with like some kind of isolated protein powder just because it, it makes it a lot easier. I see. So I kind of want to get into this conversation about like, like counting your macros mm -hmm. and relationship to like, you know, everyone's like, Oh, all it matters is if I just eat enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so when we talk about like, you know, let's say, cause I always get into this, this like conversation with people and they're like, what do I eat? And it's like, there is like this overall calories in calories out. Right. But mm -hmm. then beyond that, like the, the sources of like carbs, for example, have to have an effect. You know how like I'll, I'll hear stuff where people are like, they're just eating like candy or this and that, yeah. but it's like, but it's in the macro. So it's fine. Yeah. I'm like, how is that really affecting the body? Because at the end of the day, that's not taking into account blood sugar. Yeah. From a, so it does have an effect, probably not in the way that a lot of people think. Um, so from a completely like just mechanistic perspective, like, um, body composition perspective, right? Yeah. If you, and they've done like really highly controlled studies where they've done like say high sugar versus low sugar. There, there was one study where they like provided all the food to participants. One group was getting 10 grams of sugar a day. Another group was getting over a hundred. Both were in a calorie deficit. Both were consuming same calories, same protein. So and macros were the same. Macros were the same. Okay. And they lost the same amount of weight, same amount of fat, retained same amount of lean mass. Um, they're Holy imp both improved, had similar improvements in blood markers of health. Like even um, blood markers were the same. Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing that was a little bit different was uh, LDL improved in both groups and improved uh, just a little bit more in the low sugar group. That's probably though because they had more fiber, and fiber can lower LDL cholesterol. Okay. But so so what I will say is I now that being said. I don't think it's a good idea to purposefully consume a lot of sugar, right? Yeah. But from a mechanistic perspective, if you eat carbohydrate, it winds up as sugar anyway yeah. when it gets to your bloodstream. And um, if you look at something like fruit, you know, it's got a lot of fiber, but also has a lot of sugar, right? But we know that like people who eat more fruit are healthier, live longer, have lower rates of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So one of the things I tell people is it's, Sugar isn't necessarily the problem. It's the fact that if you're eating a lot of sugar, you're probably eating pretty low fiber as well. So balance the two, right? Yeah. Now, if you're eating a lot of candy and stuff, like you're not going to get enough fiber in. No and way. fiber is really important, not just for um, cardiovascular disease risk, cancer risk, mortality. Like there was a, a recent meta-analysis, which is just for um, in plain speak, is basically a study of studies. Okay, so they... They have certain inclusion criteria and they basically say any study that is with fits this inclusion criteria. So similar studies, yeah. we're going to lump them all in together and see what the overall effect is. Right. So they're going to combine those data points. So is it like the most effective sort of It's It's kind of like the highest form of evidence. The meta. So it's yeah. like when people are playing Call of Duty, they get the meta guns. It's like that's the, the gun set. Yeah. The I mean, best you, can, set. you can do a bad meta analysis, but for the most part, when we look at like meta-analyses, they're considered kind of the highest standard of evidence. Got it. Um, so what they found was that in a, like just under a mil, the total data points was just under a million people in all these studies. And they found that each 10 gram increase in fiber had a corresponding 10% decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease, Holy cancer, shit. and all-cause mortality. Now, it's important to point out 
you know, eating 100 grams of fiber a day is not going to make you immortal, right? Because people, <laughs> yes, I can see people doing die. that math, right? I'm never going to die. It's a, it's a relative risk. So when so fiber we, is that important? Yes. So when we say, well, we think so. Yeah. Uh, when we say risk, we mean relative risk. So for example, if you're 60 years old, for example, and your absolute risk of dying in the next 10 years is say, uh, let's just say 10%, right? Yeah. A 10% relative risk reduction is going from 10 to 9%. Because, 10% of your 10%. Right, exactly. Yeah. So when you see these headlines like X increases cancer risk by 15% or this, you know, your your absolute cancer risk, I think is something like around 5%. Like it's going up to 5.5. Like it's not, yeah. it's not like you just massively jumped up, right? Now, important, but again, fiber is so helpful for one, satiety, um, feeling full. Yeah, feeling fill, fill, yeah. feeling of fullness. Uh, two, it it really I, I, the I think a lot of the effect on cancer risk is just specifically on colorectal cancer, so colon cancer. Um, fiber has a very strong effect on reducing colon cancer risk, uh, and colon cancer is one of the more common cancers out there. Yeah. So when you reduce the risk of colon cancer, you see an effect overall. And then uh, fiber also can lower LDL cholesterol. And we think that's one of the ways in which it uh, reduces cardiovascular disease risk. And uh, we now know also based on the gut microbiome research that fiber, especially soluble fiber, is one of the main fuels for the gut microbiome, for the bacteria there. And people who eat more fiber tend to have a more diverse and healthier gut microbiome. And the fermentation products. So soluble fiber is used to be referred to as fermentable fiber yeah. because your bacteria can ferment it and produce gas, short chain fatty acids, which are like butyrate, propionate. Those short chain fatty acids seem to have some pretty impressive health effects, like in terms of improving insulin sensitivity, lowering inflammation, uh, some really impressive stuff. So all that umbrella is probably why we see these effects with fiber. So all that circling back to, you know, it's the sources of carbohydrates com for your for your body composition. Could you build as much muscle and lose as much fat eating candy if you hit your macros? Based on the evidence we have, it would say yeah, but it you you probably wouldn't want to do it that way. One, you'd be really hungry, you know, if you especially on a diet if you're consuming a yeah. high sugar diet, blood right? Blood sugar crashes, yeah. Um, well, not even that. Just I mean, think about volume, right? Think about like, um, you know, uh, 300 calories from a Snicker versus 300 calories from a big ass salad, right? Yeah, it's f way faster. Way way drinking, different. In yeah. um, you know, gut fill, um, you know, gut hormone secretion, all those sorts of things. A lot. Of, in fact, a lot of these gut hormones actually that tell us that we're full rep respond to stretch. Yeah. So, you know, volume. Um, so it's not a great idea for that. Um, the blood sugar changes. We used to think that that was driving possibly appetite and, um, you know, maybe even some downstream negative effects that appears to not make as big of a difference. Um, it's, but you know, what I find so interesting about all this shit is how much things have changed over all the years. And that's, you know, for supplements, for everything. I like, you know, BCAs used to be it. Now it's like EAs. Yeah. And I thing. even was like, you know, hey, I used to, you know, I actually had uh, something line with BCAs in it. And now yeah. in my more recent line, I don't have it. EAs, right? Uh, I, I don't have any EAs, but I do think EAs probably have more application than BCAs. Right. But I mean, that's what, you know, good science does is it, you know, you have ideas. And then as research comes out, you know, you make, you course correct. You know, yeah, and I think not to divert too much no, go ahead. and get us canceled, but like one of the problems and the distrust around science with was with God, right? Damn it, bro! And <laughs> I hate. No, I'm good. I love talking about this. <laughs> but oh, that was such a you know the the problem, and you know people were like, oh, you know, because now you say trust the science, everyone's like, nope. Well, the problem is. And I said this right at the beginning. I'm like, 30 years from now, we're going to be able to look back and go, this was good. This was bad. We should have done this. We should have done this. But it's basically like trying to sail the ship while you're building it. Bro, right? I, God, you're, I'll you're, never understand that. You're, that. you're like basically like, okay, we think 
You know, the idea was like, all right, lockdowns will flatten the curve. It'll help from overwhelming the healthcare system. And now looking at the retrospective studies, it seems like lockdowns didn't really help that much. Yeah. You know, um, masks didn't really seem to do a whole lot. Um, you know, the this is going to get me in trouble because I'll get hate from both sides. The vaccine works. Um, are, do some people have side effects? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but on balance, does it? So this is where people have a really hard time with like holding two facts that seem to be opposing, yeah, yeah. right? Which is, yes, some people get myocarditis from the vaccine. Like this, this is shown. Okay. It's terrible. But the rate of myocarditis from the vaccine is still significantly lower than the rate of myocarditis from people who get infected with. So, so, so still people who just never took it got myocarditis through at a higher rate than people who had it. Interesting. So when you're, when you're looking at stuff like this, you know, as a person, if you get the vaccine, for example, and then you get myocarditis from the vaccine, you're like this vaccine, right? right? But it also saved a lot of lives. Now, when we're making decisions, I think this is what people don't understand the concept of risk, right? You can wear your seatbelt and have an airbag and still die in a car crash. Yeah. That doesn't mean those things don't help, right? And sometimes seatbelts and airbags kill people. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that on balance, on the average, that we see a benefit, right? So this is the problem that a lot of people are struggling with, is they're getting this information about these bad things with the vaccine, and then on the other side, you have people saying, no, there's no side effects. It's all perfectly safe. This is all made up. You know, it's, you know, everybody should have yeah. it. And the 15th booster and all that well, kind that's, of stuff. I think the problem is not so much in the, the science itself. It's in the, the presentation and the, the sides that are pushing it versus not pushing it. And here's the problem, too. And it becomes political, which is like, what the fuck is going on? But here's the problem. If you give people all that nuance, sometimes you just confuse them, right? Yeah. And then if you're, so I'm, I would, again, I'm get myself in trouble, but I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm an independent, but I'm most closely aligned as probably a libertarian. Okay? okay. But, you know, if you're the government and you think that like you, the research data suggests that this vaccine will save a lot of lives. Is it more important for you to give all the information and possibly confuse people or just be like, just take this damn thing so we can save people's lives, right? Yeah. So it's like the Machiavellian, do the ends justify the means, you know? Yeah, it's fucked There's always why I always say, I'm glad I'm not in charge, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm glad I'm not in charge. I see. I guess I, the thing that I didn't like during that whole time was like the, the lack of like focus on everything else that it also affected the way yeah. they, like the way that they performed the whole lockdown, all the other stuff that came along with it. That was like, but what about all this other shit that also is killing people and people are now dealing with and livelihoods and all and this other stuff. That's also that's just being the complicated. The problem is there's always unintended downstream effects that you, you cannot predict. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're seeing it with the schools with kids that are, we have a whole generation of kids that's way behind. Yeah. Um, you're seeing it with people who were on social media before, but now it's like even worse, Bro, you know, in terms of just being completely like sucked in. And I put myself in that category cause I kind of do, you know, social media is kind of my job now. Yeah. Weirdly. Um, but like, I'll even find myself sometimes like, like doom scrolling and being, and having yeah, to be like, and it's what the am I doing? Yeah. You know? And it's such a weird thing, man. Cause like, it wasn't like this five years ago. It wasn't like this even feeling like four years ago. It's like, it's almost all started to happen the way it did after. I think. And it's just know, like, you get sucked into whatever thing you start clicking on. You just get pulled more down that ideology of yeah. like this way. So then you, it's like people are just pinning everyone against each other. And that, and that's part of the, you see this in the nutrition tribes too, the polarization of stuff and how yeah. people just get, really entrenched in a position, right? And you see so much cognitive dissonance, which is why, like even, I don't even identify as a libertarian because I see libertarians saying where I'm like, come on, guys. Yeah. Like, no, no. I think the thing that really gets me frustrated is like, it, same thing when it comes to, some kid will come to me and go, what's the best diet for this? And I'm like, exactly. There, I, I, there is literally, I cannot give you an answer because I, there, there's the only way you know is if you put in the time to see what really works for you. Right. And that's why you say when you talk about, 
even like the whole like do this or don't do this thing, like because they don't want to get into all the nuances of like why this or why that or maybe this, maybe a little less of that. It's because it's not that simple. No, and and unfortunately, simple, you know, clickbaity, do these three things. That's all people want. You know, avoid these three things. Yeah. And I think more than that, you know, I've talked about this, whether it's politics, religion, diet, training, whatever. People get tribal about damn near everything. Chevy versus Ford. Yeah, you know, yeah. people get tribal about everything. It's you a human get, nature thing. It's it, it is. And I but think it's that's like speed ramp now. That's the, the issue. Yeah. yeah. And what you're having is people, they, you say one thing. Like if you just take a snapshot of me saying, you know, the vaccines probably saved lives. People would take that and be like, you lived hard, you know? Yeah. And it's like. Well, that's also now the digestion of how people are just getting info now. They're not watching the full thing. It's just all out of context clips. And they go this. And you also, we tend to go into information silos, right? I said this actually like 10 years ago before social media got bad was, you know, the people I kind of hung around, hung around a lot of, you know, other scientists, people who you know, weren't really dogmatic thinkers who were not, were not. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we'd have discussions and disagreements and like, you just, when you're talking to a person like one-on-one, I always say a person is relatively smart. People in groups are really dumb. Um, And so I just being in that group, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I don't, see why everybody's so upset about things. And then I'd go out and I'd like see some of these things on Twitter and I'd be like, how are motherfuckers this dumb? Like I, it actually is blows my mind, but you realize it's not even, it's not even necessarily an intelligence thing because you have really smart people who believe really dumb. All you need to do is go down the list of, you can find this on, on, on a list of Nobel prize winners who believed in absolute craziness in other fields like you had you had no i'm not kidding there's there's multiple nobel prize winners who believed in eugenics there were multiple nobel prize winners who believed in like healing crystals and linus pauling thought that you know 18 crystals don't work (laughs) god damn it my whole room stay tuned for bradley's crystals coming out (laughs) with this new line um you know but but just because you're smart in one discipline or you understand things, smart people actually get worse cognitive dissonance in general than, than, than unintelligent people because they use their own intelligence to justify, well, I wouldn't believe in bullshit, right? Yeah. And so I think this, and I really have to give a lot of credit to my PhD advisor, Don Lehman, <laughs> because he crushed so many of my, in a kind way, yeah. so many of the things that I believe to be true that I just got to the point where I was okay with being wrong, you know? And I was okay with saying, oh, you know what? That's a good point. I never thought of it like that before. Or, you know, that's a great point. Like I, uh, uh, Chris, uh, do you know Chris Williamson? Yes. Okay. So yeah. he posted. I'm supposed to go do his pod. Yeah. He, he posted something the other day about a new study came out showing that like birth control was associated with depression and women. And I just left a comment. I was like, you know, I haven't read the study, but just be quick, just be careful jumping to conclusions, everyone, because, you know, there's a lot of confounding variables here. You know, that is also the age when people start taking birth control where they get more on social media and that has been linked to depression. So like, just be careful. And like the amount of, first off, the amount of women who are like, you can't comment on this if you're not a woman. And I'm like, okay, um, all right, I'm not going to comment on your body and your experience, but I can read data, okay? But then one person said, well, yeah, but the people who were taking birth control, you know, were they on, so they probably were on social media too. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I didn't, that's a good point. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I can admit, like, that's a good point. Yeah. Like, you know, unless I have data to show that people who take birth control tend to be on social media more than people who don't, that's kind of a null and void. So yeah. that person actually made a great point. And I have no problem admitting that, right? Yeah. Because it's like, I tell people at the end of the day, I care more about getting the right answer. Now, I like being right. Don't get me wrong. I'll do cartwheels in my living room if I'm right. <laughs> but I care more about getting the right answer than being right. Because my, like the most horrific thing for me would to be the dude who's still parroting the same shit from 15 years ago. Yeah. Say, no, bro, this is how it works. This is how it works. Because... 
whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but there's 80 studies that show it doesn't, right? Quick interruption for the podcast. One of the most important interruptions. I've talked about this many, many times and I'll continue to talk about this because of how important it is. Mental health, guys. If you have ever considered therapy, you're on the right path, okay? Now, is therapy alone gonna fix all your problems? No, of course not, right? But sometimes learning from an unbiased perspective, someone kind of can help you decipher your situation is so valuable so that you can then change your actions, change yourself, change your future, change where you wanna go, right? Otherwise, you just kinda go in circles. So I promise you, give this a shot, betterhelp.com. Uh, I've been talking about, again, it's almost a year of me, me doing ads about this, but it's important because it's so important for people to take this serious. Your physical health is obviously the most important thing, but your mental health is the thing that's going to dictate physically, everything else like in your life. If you're not good mentally, you're going to be bad everywhere, okay? I've been there. I go in and out of there, but the reality is like I've, I've developed enough skills over time. I've done therapy. I've done talk therapy. I've done tons of forms of my own types of therapy, like the gym therapy, but I've developed enough skills over time now being 34 years old to deal with the issues at hand. You guys may be younger, maybe haven't developed those skills, right? And, and therapy can help you do that if you haven't developed any of those skills or if you need to develop more of those skills. So go to betterhelp.com slash raw talk. That's better, H-E-L-P.com slash raw talk to get 10% off your first month. Let's get back into this podcast. Yeah, so it's like, I guess in, in regards to just the ideas that people have and like them, the, the dogged kind of like, this is the only way, would you would you th would you say that that kind of like that thought process is getting worse or I think it's getting worse. With I think it's media. getting worse. Um, and because of social media, because you you most people don't follow people who are going to intellectually challenge their ideals. Right. Yeah. That's um, a fact. You know, I mean, listen, I'm a I'm a firearm owner. I love shooting. It's one of my hobbies. Um, and I I do believe in the Second Amendment. Um, but, but I don't follow people who are anti second amendment, right? Like, yeah. you know, that's an example of an information silo now. Um, so, you know, I follow, if I follow anybody, it's people who are going to probably be pro. So I'm not getting those other arguments, you know, and like, I can admit this about myself. Right. Um, but, and I think, you know, even with that particular thing, like I tell people, when it comes to anything, be it nutrition, politics, legislature, there are no solutions. Everything is a trade-off, right? That's the problem. It, that's one of the big problems is people don't want to admit the trade-offs, right? So I can, I can say um, a great example about this is if you want something else that's really hot right now is seed oils, okay? Oh, everyone's been talking about this. <sighs> it's always the craziest people too everyone's been talking about i'm this. like look at these people's eyeballs bugging out bro, of their head i'm not gonna lie i was tripping on seed oils for a bit <laughs> i'm not gonna lie bro i think i saw something you were talking Brad's about i was throwing like, all the shit out of this house i was house. like everything has fucking seed oil in it <laughs> no everything does though dude well so so is it gonna kill me is it giving me cancer all right so break this shit down so a great example of this is um the way they, the people who are anti seed oil kind of package this is, yeah. well, if you look at the last, you know, 50 years, an increase in type 2 diabetes and obesity, and it, it tracks with increased seed oil consumption, right? But the problem with that is seed oils are in a lot of processed foods, high caloric density, um, and the, the, the biggest contributor to the increased caloric intake in the last few decades has been added oils, yeah. and which is mostly from seed oils or basically polyunsaturated fats, omega-6s. Yeah. Um, and so they'll, pa they'll, they'll say, okay, look at that. Now look at this like in vitro or animal data where they give a bunch of this stuff and they see these negative outcomes, right? Well, here's the thing. If you overfeed anything, you overfeed carbs, you overfeed saturated fat, you overfeed anything, you have negative outcomes, right? Um, so I, what I said- That's a certainty. What's that? That's a certainty. Yeah, if, you, if, if people- if you add weight, add body fat, like excess body fat, adipose tissue is inflammatory. Got adipose it. tissue itself secretes adipokines, which are inflammatory. Uh, adipose tissue itself in excess, because I don't think people are thinking, well, I'm 5% and I got to 8, so I'm unhealthy. Yeah. No. Although some people well, aren't say I obese. considered obese? Well, by BMI, yes. Yeah. Um, but not by body fat percentage. Body fat percentage is the true definition of obesity. So Now... Uh, just a quick side note on BMI, because people will say, oh, BMI sucks. Well, 
here's the problem. If you want to get a large data set of people, like 50,000 people, for example, and look at the effects of obesity, you're not going to find 50,000 people who've had a DEXA done. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Or even calipers. So BMI is a great proxy for obesity. Now, for somebody like you or me, yeah, it's not applicable. But we're like, how many people, this is going to sound arrogant, how many people look like us walking around the streets? Yeah, no, no, no. Like, we're, we're in the fitness industry, so we have body dysmorphia, right? Terrible, we're, we're like, We're like, okay, Horrible. everyone looks like Kai Green, right? Yeah. And then like, go to the beach. You know what I mean? Like, go to the beach. You're, yeah. you're, you're a freak. Like, we're, it's weird how the fitness industry just fucks completely destroys your 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 image of yourself yeah especially when you start like you know you show day or like when you and your best peak and then like me and like trying to like look my best for social media and then i'm like if it's not good enough it's just like terrible for me well and then people leave comments and shit. you're yeah. fucking fat yeah, dude. Yeah, you're yeah. washed up you suck like, wait i'm like legit yeah so bmi is a good uh a good proxy it's about 80 to 90 percent accurate we'll say right yeah. so anyways so Gaining too much fat is bad for you. Now, if you, what I'll say is, okay, let's compare apples to apples, right? So if you, because most of these folks who are anti-seed oil are like pro-saturated fat. They're like, oh, steak and butter is good for you. It's healthy. Okay, well, let's look at human randomized control trials where they reduce saturated fat and put Omega-6s, polyunsaturated fats in place of them, okay? And when we look at metabolic health, like liver fat, um, insulin sensitivity, um, cardiovascular disease risk, cancer risk, like your kind of hard outcomes, right? Like stuff that is actually what we care about for yeah. health. Health markers, yeah. You either see a neutral or positive effect, okay? Now... I'm not saying seed oils are innocuous because they are in a lot of processed stuff, highly palatable, easy to overconsume. Yeah. So if it's causing you to overconsume calories, yeah, it's still a negative, but it's not something inherent to it itself. It's the fact that you're basically having energy toxicity, right? Like I very much doubt the people out there who are in really bad health, it's because they, they're they cooking with canola oil. You know what I mean? No, they're having potato chips and a bunch of processed crap with a lot of calories All the time. that also has these things in them, right? Yeah. And so uh, getting back to the original thing, which was, um, so Paul Saladino, who's a big proponent of the carnivore diet and a big uh, seed oil. That's what I was going to um, mention, by the way. Seed oil destroyer, seed oil disrespecter. Um he, I, I cited these studies and he says, well, look at this study though, which is a human, which was a human randomized control trial where they showed, um, polyunsaturated fats versus saturated fats increased lipid oxidation. Okay. Or peroxidation. That's, that's a negative thing, but that's what we call a mechanism. Okay. So when we look at human outcomes, cardiovascular disease risk, cancer, insulin sensitivity, body fat gain. These are like hard endpoints, okay? A mechanism is basically like you're saying it activated this pathway, it did this thing, which may be negative. But that doesn't necessarily mean there'll be an outcome from it. Let me give you a financial example. So a mechanism is like a single stock, okay? Outcomes are like mutual funds, right? So what he's doing is basically saying, oh, this mutual fund, don't invest in this. Look at this stock in it that's down 50% this year. But what if the overall mutual fund's up by 25%? Who gives a shit about that one stock, right? So what I'm saying is whatever you consume probably has positive and negative effects. And the question is, what is the overall effect? What is the overall summation of it, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people, when they argue this stuff, like I can admit, okay, maybe that's a negative effect of omega-6s, right? But that single negative effect obviously isn't powerful enough to offset the positive effects that are producing better insulin sensitivity, lower cardiovascular disease risk, lower cancer, or cancer risk was kind of the same, um, lower liver fat, those sorts of things, 
right? Does that make does that kind of make yeah, sense? Yeah, well, it's isolating something and right. saying this is this is the reason why it's bad instead right. of like looking at the whole picture. And uh, same thing with like um, another example would be like um, ketogenic diet. People will say, well, on a keto diet, you burn way more fat, which is true. You do. You burn more fat. Um, but fat burning or fat oxidation and the loss of body fat are not the same thing. So explain. Okay. So, you know, like with uh, gaining muscle, it's the balance between protein synthesis and protein degradation, right? right? So you, you have to be synthesizing more tissue than you're breaking down, but both are always happening at the same time. Yeah. Loss of body fat is the balance between the amount of fat you store versus the amount of fat you burn. Both things are always happening, happening simultaneously. Okay. So even in the calorie deficit, you're still storing fat, but you're just burning more fat in a calorie surplus. You're still burning fat. You're just storing more fat. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you, so like take a ketogenic diet, for example, um, and compare it in studies where they equate calories and equate protein, low carb diets versus low fat diets, they don't show, di they, there's no difference in overall fat loss. But how could that be possible when the keto diet is causing people to burn so much more fat? And it is a, a pretty significant effect. Well, Dietary carbohydrate isn't really stored as fat, okay? So they've done metabolic tracer studies where they give uh, glucose that's labeled with like a stable isotope, and then they can track where it winds up, right? Less than 2% of the fat that you store in adipose originates as dietary carbohydrate. Over 98% comes from the fat you consume, okay? So that means if you're eating a high fat, low carb diet, you're burning a lot of fat, but you're also storing a lot of fat. If you're eating a high, high carb. carb, low fat diet, you're not burning much fat because insulin suppresses lipolysis and whatnot. But you're not storing much fat. But you're not storing much fat. Wait, what the f <laughs> When did this come out? Um, it's been out for a long time? Well, I mean, the... So the studies basically showing that there's no difference in actual fat loss, that a meta analysis that kind of like put the, put the exclamation point on it came out in 2017 or 18 by Kevin Hall. Okay. And then like the tracer studies are all like early two thousands and stuff, but you could see like you're trying to like tie this stuff together to paint a picture that makes sense. Right. Yes. And so like to me, people will cite these studies and this is what you see with social media folks all the time. The ones that sound like they know what they're talking about. They're like, well, there was a study. I can tell you don't like Paul. I don't have a personal beef with Paul. <laughs> I, love, I don't like, I don't I like love, the fact that he... I love this. I don't like the fact that he... I'm sure he's a perfectly nice person. Yeah, he's a nice you know? guy. I've seen him. Um, I met him at my gym once. Nice guy. And, and I, you know, I... Okay, so this is something I have changed my mind on. I think most people who are say making false claims i don't think it's malicious yeah. and i don't necessarily even think it's to primarily to make money now like people with like paul who have big following don't end up making money off their stuff right of course but i i don't necessarily think that i i do think he wants to help people i Absolutely. think he actually believes the stuff he's saying yeah. right and the problem is when you're so entrenched in an idea and you have such a strong belief system that's where cognitive dissonance comes in because you can't, and especially when you've made something an identity, right? Of course. So you notice, like, I'm, I mean, you know, like, macro tracking, flexible dieting, I was kind of the one who popularized that. Yeah. Where's flexible dieting in my Instagram handle or my bio? Right, right, right. Where's, I see. When you've branded it as your where's brand. Where's IIFYM guru? Right. It, no, because I don't want to be tied to something like that. Well, because it's also so changing, it sounds like. Everything is so, like, fluid. Exactly. Like, I want to, like, tomorrow, if uh, I, I have about a point zero 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 one percent chance that this would happen, but if a bunch of studies came out that I was like, oh, wow, carnivore diet does look like the healthiest diet, I, I don't want to be like, well, you know, I can't change my mind because of all this stuff I've, done, I've said. Yeah, yeah, I want to yeah, be yeah. able to change my mind, you know? So I think the problem becomes when you've made an identity... And especially now when your livelihood's tied to it, yeah, right? You got to stick to it. You, you kind of got to stick to it. And it's why I really respect people. Like uh, I just did Thomas DeLauer's podcast. I, I, used, I used to call Thomas out all the time for stuff he would say. 
And he actually like changed his mind on a lot of stuff. And it had, and he's like, dude, it's crazy because like half my audience like gets really mad at me now for this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it's because like, you know, that was their identity too. And they, yeah. they're going to view you as like a traitor, you know? Yeah. It's weird. It's almost it's like, like it's, us versus them, you know? It's even the same way with, for content creators. This is on a, a different scale, but where it's like, if you start out, like if I start out making fitness content and then I stop making fitness content forever, they're like, wait, what the fuck? Where's, no, you're that thing. Yeah. That's I, your I thing. you as that. That's you forever. You get back in your box. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. But so, so, okay. It's Paul, right? So on that note, what do you think about the liver king? What do you think about the liver? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got some funny Liver King stories. Um, again, sure, if you met him, he's a perfectly nice guy. You nice know? guy. Um, Great character. Like, right, but that's character. what it is. Yeah, this was. Character. This is. I, I said this from the I'm like, this is not a person. This is a marketing company. They okay? crushed. They did. Hundred million dollars, dude. Crushed. Like, you know. And now the emails from Derek came out. You yeah, can yeah. see the arc of what happened. You yeah. know. Um, but and I you do saw wanna, recently he came back. And was like. And I'm back on steroids. Did you see that? Yeah, I'm, I'm he's like, sure I'm he off. Was. I'm sorry. And then he came back. He's well, like, you, you know what? You, it, I'm on. Well, if you read like some of the emails too, he definitely has some body dysmorphia stuff going well, on. Well, that was a lot of steroids. <laughs> like, it's, it's not it's like just $10, like $10,000 of GH just by itself. It's not normal. That's not normal. That's not even like normal bodybuilding. Right. That's like, I don't know. Anyways. So I want so, your perspective on that whole, that whole, because that was a craze for a minute. Yeah. So I think like when it comes to, People like Paul. So, for example, if I show this evidence, he has to find some way to discredit it because he can't, like, I can acknowledge, okay, you showed that paper on LDL oxidation. Maybe that is a negative effect of omega-6, but the overall effect is still either neutral or positive. So I'm, you know, like, I'm not really worried about seed oils, at least from a physiological perspective, even though they're significant contributor calories, people may need to limit them, right? Yeah. But, you know, he... He's made his identity around this. He can't. He can't. He can't admit that. Can't like if he did, it. it'd be hard for him to go back. Even when he like started eating carbs again, because he was uh, he started eating honey and some fruit. He's like, oh, I felt better from like an electrolyte perspective. I'm like, no, dude, you feel better because you're eating carbs. Like yeah, carbs are great. But he can't. Yeah, but uh, he can't. He can't say that because and, and maybe he's changed his tune because I don't watch his content religiously, um, but. Like, it's hard for him to say that because he, you know, was knocking on carbs for so long, you know? Now, the Liver King thing, I think, honestly, so I remember people started sending me his videos and I went to his page and he had like 12,000 followers. And I'm like, this is a joke. I'm like, nobody's going to fall for this shit. Dude. And then I went back and it's like a million followers. And I'm like, oh, f*** me, people. It's the internet, though, you know? And a lot of people were like, you know... I follow him just for entertainment. Okay, cool. But you have to understand, like, you're still actually helping him. Like, you're still helping him make money. Because people go there. Let's say half the people follow him just for entertainment value, right? Yeah. People go and see a million followers and they go, credible. Yeah. I mean, as dumb as it is. I've had people actually say to me, you're just trying to bring Paul down. He's got 1.7 million followers and you've got, you know, under 900,000. I'm like, I'm doing okay. Like, I, I'm not really... I yeah. make a good living and I'm not really worried about it. Like, I, I don't, I'm a pretty simple You've guy. always seemed to care more about like, just like realistic shit, like working versus not working. Like this work or not. Like that's all I've ever seen from your stuff. I just like veracity. You know what I mean? Like I'm a big, I have this weird, so I'm like ADHD. If I'd gotten tested for autism when I was young, I probably would have been on this. I probably am on the spectrum. Yeah. There are certain things with me where it's like Wapner at six. Like, you know what I mean? Like Rain Man, yeah. like where I'm just like, like I can recall the authors, the year of all these different studies. Um, and there's something about like things that I know are demonstrably false where I'm like, nope, not going to let it slide. Fuck that. You know, you go after it. and I, and I go after it, you know? Um, so with the liver King, I was just kind of like, honestly, I'll be real. It kind of, I don't want to say depression. I wasn't depressed, but it, it made me kind of sad. Cause I'm like, like, this is obviously, uh, like who actually believes this? An act. It's obviously this an is act. obviously an act. 
even Rogan, who has been known to entertain people who are not the most, you know, accurate scientifically at times, he's like, come on, guys, this is, you know, like, he's like, yeah. come on. Um, and so I'm like, man, like, here I am. I've been in this industry 20 years working my ass off. And I, don't get me wrong. I make a good living. Like, I'm very, I consider myself very fortunate. Yeah. Um, but it ain't like a hundred million dollars. You know what I mean? And so it, it wasn't that I was jealous of that. It was more like, damn, you can just make it up. And in a couple years, you can be rich, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's kind of sad, you know? And I, what I tell people is the reason it makes me upset is because everyone was ignorant at some point. I was ignorant at some point. You were, yeah. you know, some people have a better bullshit detector than others, you know? Yeah. And you benefit, you're just, people are benefiting financially from it. Right. Which is the thing. And same. It, it can be in some ways harming people as well. Yeah. Like maybe not physically, but even like the, the emotion of like, you feel really desperate to find something that works and you hear everybody raving about this and this person saying it's the answer. And then you do it. It doesn't work. And, and even, even more demo, demoralized. Exactly. And, and, and so many people down. are like, well, you know, and I, I don't mean to pick on the carnivore community, but it's just the most popular, the more popular thing at the moment. People are like, well, look at all these people who are having these great results. It's like, you know who doesn't talk about stuff in these groups? People who get fucked up by it. Yeah. Like, because guess what happens when, and I've seen this because I, I lurk on some of these forums and Facebook groups. Guess what happens when somebody is like losing their hair or they're actually having, like you can get that this has happened. People get like cholesterol deposits around their eyelids where it's like yellow and bulbousy oh, and shit. I'm going to assume that they kick them out. People the are like, you must be having seed oils somewhere in your diet or you must be sneaking carbs or you're sneaking alcohol or it's like this gaslighting what well, can't possibly be from the carnivore diet, you know? Um, and so... If you see that and you start having negative effects, what are you, you going to do? You're not going to post about it because you don't want to get bullied by this group. You know what I mean? Well, the world is so weird. You're, you're going you're gonna to either stop doing it or just like be quiet about it. And so I think that's the thing that upsets me is it's like, why can't we just, hey, like I'm not anti-animal protein. Like so, some of my funding for my research was from uh, Dairy Council, Egg Nutrition Center, and National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Like I'm all for like protein, like animal proteins as yeah. high quality proteins, but let's not like pretend that there's no downsides to like some of this stuff to any of it yeah. or, or like overdoing it, you know? And so I think that's just the hard part is, you know, I always tell people like when I talk about this stuff or I do debates or, or whatever it is, or I'm posting about this stuff. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not really worried about trying to change somebody's opinion who's fully entrenched. I know that that's probably not going to happen, right? Yeah. Or if I'm you know, debating with somebody in a comment section or whatever, it, or on Twitter, it's not for their benefit. I'm hoping the people who are watching, it just gets them to start being like, oh, never thought of it Thinking, that way. This is what it comes down to. Because there is, I mean, in so many things, man, it doesn't matter if it's in nutrition, if it's in like, like branding, if it's in just social media in general, it's like everyone just wants to be right and everyone just wants to know that they're doing the right thing. But people are not willing to, number one, admit when they're wrong or see when they're wrong. And the problem, I think, lies and it's just like, and I've talked about this so many other different ways and other conversations on podcasts with tons of other people that I really look up to and respect. It's just people need to learn to be able to think for themselves and to critically think for themselves. And that's the biggest problem that, like, we have such a great ability now to share what we know, but not everything we know and the way we know it is exactly right for every other person. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the internet is that like now, like you said, you get these, these like these almost cultish type followings around certain things, brands, people, ideas, and they go, this is it. And then, like you said, even if it's not, we're not even talking about politics, same thing though, <clears throat> you go down that hole, you just get more from that hole, you go deeper into that hole. Yeah. And then when something, it could be like, this could also benefit you, and it's, but it's over there, and it's not agreeing with no, this. It's, it's just wrong. And that's the problem is like, people are losing their abilities to think because they just go almost everything. Like, I don't need to know, I just gotta look at my phone. Yeah. And my phone's gonna give me my identity. And that's what's happening that's really weird on the internet on all scales. It's so scary. 
it's scary and it, it it makes me scared about like the conflicts that are going on and how quickly oh, those man. things can escalate. I don't watch the news because otherwise I would just, you know, bro. Like and it's, and it's all just like, it's like, it's so weird. It's like people post this, people post that. I will say this one thing I saw, which just really fucking freaked me out. It was a guy who his whole page right now is devoted to like being like Israel sucks. Right. Right. And in it is also like Israel sucks. And again, I have no, I have no skin in this game. I can't sit here and say this or that. I don't know enough about it, but it's like Israel sucks. He's like a picture of him going like this. Mm -hmm. And then his, and then under it's like, join my course. It's like, what the fuck are we doing? Uh. Like, are we like, it's, are you, it's like you're using like people's, lives and people's people dying to like sell some it's like crazy. i i can't i saw this the other day on twitter and i was like that's insane it's well, a guy I, like this it's something about israel with the little israel flag and then selling his course right under it i'm like this is f-ing, again people, this is like you're the devil dude i think more to the point one of the things that's makes it tough to get factual information and receive it is here's the other thing people tend to follow people who tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. Right? So this is why what I say, and I tell people, I'm like, I mean, you know, because I've been around the industry forever, right? Yeah. But a lot of people, I've only like, I would say in the last couple years gotten like really popular where like more mainstream folks are kind of finding me. It's, it's taken about you 10 years ago. Right. It's, it's taken crazy. 20 years to get yeah. here, right? Yeah. Because my message isn't really that sexy. It's like, no, nope, you know, nah. it's mostly consistency and yeah. doing these fundamental things right. And, you know, well, that's what works, though. Adherence. And, yeah, exactly. I'm like, I don't I don't care. You give me any job, sport, whatever. I talked about this on I was on Gabby Reese's podcast the other yeah. day. I'm like, I, I, I know very little about your career arc, but I'm guessing. You were you you had some genetic advantages for sure. Me, <laughs> you and Gabby. <laughs> but you were really consistent. You worked really hard and you probably had to overcome some pretty significant setbacks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's with anybody yeah. and entrepreneurship, business, whatever you can pick it, anything. Um, that's not really sexy. What people want to hear is the three foods that will turn you into a fat burning machine. Yeah. Do three minutes cold plunge per day and, you know, incinerate fat, you know, like that's, that's the sexy stuff. And you, people want to believe in bullshit. Yeah. Because it's much more palatable than, you know what? It's actually a lot of personal responsibility and just work. you doing a shit ton of work. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Over what do you think really about cold plunges long though? period of time? For real though. Okay. Because I fucking love them. Holding two things in, in yeah, both yeah, hands. Yeah. Break right? it down. Here we go. I love them. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. Benefits. Uh, reduces inflammation, reduces soreness, improves time to recovery from exercise. Downsides. Um... It actually seems to attenuate the gain of lean mass in people who resistance train. So they've shown that it can actually depress muscle protein synthesis. What? I thought and it was the opposite of that. No, no. So now th- people will hear this and they'll say, Lane said you couldn't build muscle on a cold plunge. Well, just look at Bradley. God damn no, no, it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying on balance, you can still build muscle doing cold plunges. The research just seems to indicate you're not going to build as much as you would if you didn't. Okay. So um, they've shown that, you know, cold water immersion is kind of what they call it in the literature, that it depresses muscle protein synthesis. And they've actually shown, you know, over time, people, you know, if they have one group, if they're both doing the same training programs, the group doing the cold plunges tends to gain a little bit less muscle than the group that's not doing them. Now, that being said, I'm not saying don't do cold plunges. Some people are like, well, I like the way it makes me feel. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Um, You know, not everybody's goal is to be Ronnie Coleman. You know what I mean? Right? Like, um, or some people have said, well, you know, like, let's take, um, let's take MMA fighters, right? Like you're getting ready for a fight. Well, what do you have to do to get ready for a fight? You got to fight. Well, guess what happens when you fight? You get beat up, right? And you, yeah. inflammation, you got swelling, you know, well, cold plunge for those guys make a lot of sense. They don't care if they're the most muscular version of themselves they can possibly be like, you know, they want some lean mass, but mostly as it just relates to, you know, them being strong. So, uh, you know, I think cold plunges are a useful utility. Yeah. I think if you are a specifically like competitive bodybuilder, 
probably not optimal for what you want to do. Um, if you're an athlete or you're, especially people who are like, you know, peaking for some sort of competition that involves a lot of training where you're really sore and beat up a lot. And even like, for example, if I, like I'm a, I'm a power lifter, I still compete in powerlifting. Um, if I had a, a meet coming up, it may be that, you know, doing a couple cold plunges is more beneficial for me to not have soreness for my next training session so I can actually lift effectively than whatever little amount, tiny amount of muscle it may suppress, you right. know? So again, trade-offs, right? You just got to decide what you pick. Uh, personally, I hate cold water. <laughs> Bro, I but, love that shit. But some people love it, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I get the appeal too, like, you know, like Andrew Huberman kind of talks about this, like, yeah. hey, you're doing something you don't like that's hard, and when you do that, it actually kind of improves your mood for the rest of the day because you've done this hard. I, I totally get that. It's like, even just a cognitive thing. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. Um, but again, I'm like, hey, here's all the upsides. Here's the downside. Now you make informed decision yeah. on, on, on what you want to do. What right? about like a nice hot bath? Uh, so what's interesting about recovery modalities. So if you look at um, research on recovery using heat, ice, um, compression, massage, dry needling, uh, even compression garments. Yeah. Anything is better than nothing. Like even compression garments have been shown to like improve recovery. Yeah. So part of me thinks it might actually be a placebo thing because like you can't really placebo a cold plunge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, you're in cold water and when I say placebo, so this is, I think you'll find this very interesting. <clears throat> when I say placebo, I think a lot of people get really offended by that because they think, well, Lane's saying I'm making it up. Whatever my experience is, is, is just in my head. That's not what I'm saying. In research studies, placebo in some cases has been shown to be as powerful as pharmaceutical drugs in terms of like actual well, physical This concept outcomes. is so insane then because that's, that's, that's like directly saying how strong your mind is. Yeah. So let, That's me, give, crazy. let me give you an example. We know creatine works, right? Like we have thousands of double-blinded randomized control trials, which so double-blinded means that one group's getting creatine, one group's getting placebo. The people getting it don't know what they're getting and the researchers don't know what they're getting either. Okay? So um, what when you do a, a double-blinded, you have to have a, uh, a company come in and basically like make sure that the researchers don't know and like the, the information about who's getting what is kept until it's time to analyze the data. Yeah. So this is important because, you know, researchers could buy us a study because maybe they yell a little bit louder on the last few reps for the people getting creatine versus the people not, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But if it's double blinded, they can't do that. Right. Or maybe so, they're the ones backing the test, like someone's paying them to do the thing. So we know that creatine works, Yeah. but there was a study where they had four groups and one, so one group didn't get creatine, told they didn't get it. Another group didn't get creatine, told they got it. Yeah. Another group got creatine, told cigar. they didn't get it. And the last group got creatine, told they got it. Didn't matter what they gave them. What it matters is what they told them in terms of performance Fucking crazy and strength. Now people will misinterpret that and go, oh, creatine doesn't work. No, no, no. It just means your beliefs about what creatine does are more powerful than what it actually does. Oh, my God. Another one. Um, the re researchers uh, told subjects or didn't tell them that they were getting it. Nobody got anabolic steroids. But they told them, hey, we're giving you this fast-acting steroid that makes you stronger. And they got stronger. Like, <laughs> their one rep max, I think the average increase was like 5%. Can you imagine putting 5% on your one rep max so, or so, something? So so explain this. This is just how powerful, that's how powerful the mind you're, is. You're, you're taking the governor. So, I can't believe I can fly and actually fly, right? But if my neurological inhibi inhibitor on me, for example, like, I don't think this would happen to me because my training and, like, like, all the competitions I've done, I've learned how to take that inhibitor off. You know what I mean? And really maximize. Yeah. But for people who don't have, you know, 20 years of competitive experience, really like sharpening their, the mental aspect of things, like it's probably removing that inhibitor, right? Where you just believe it so much that now 
you're actually realizing your actual potential. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so again, it doesn't mean that creatine doesn't work. It just means that what you believe about creatine is more powerful than what it really does. Uh, and even there was a, a study where I think it was a little bit longer duration where they, I, they told people, hey, we're going to give you anabolic steroids. One group was told they got them. Another group told they didn't get them. And wouldn't you know it, the group told they got them over time gained more lean mass. Bro, that's, like, that's amazing. Now, some people might say, well, they're just training harder because they believe and they're recovering. Maybe they're recovering better because they believe. And so, like, they're just able to push more weight and, that, and that's why, right? But we've actually seen this affect, like, other things that aren't subjective. So, for example... Um, there was a more recent study. They um, gave people uh, two pre-workouts. Both were placebos. One was a clear liquid. One was a pink liquid. Which one do you think people got better results pink. from? The pink liquid. Yeah. Yeah. So those people got about 5% more reps on, on bench press. Bro, what the, the fuck? <laughs> um, but this is even, cool, though. It is cool. Um and then, like, another study, and I'm going to butcher the study because I read it a long time ago, but essentially, are you familiar with ghrelin? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a hormone that, like, signals that you're hungry. Yeah, I'm hungry. Um, Leptin signals that you're full. Yeah. 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 So they had people, and it was part of a larger study where they're kind of looking at genetic polymorphisms of people who secrete more or less ghrelin, but they had them, and they measured their levels of ghrelin, and then they randomly told them what they were, right? So same like four quadrants, right? You had people who were low ghrelin told they were low ghrelin, low ghrelin told they were high ghrelin, high ghrelin told they were low ghrelin, and high ghrelin told they were high ghrelin. What matter? Guess what mattered? Oh my god! What they bro. told them? What the f dude? Yep. So how? So so it's just like our. It's just our minds are really that f sharp. Well, I think you know we used to view. And actually, I've gotten really into the research in like pain literature um, because, you know, I've, I've gone through like herniated discs in my back. And, you know, I, I there was a point in 2017 where like for a 36 hour period, I couldn't stand up. Like I just li literally laid on my side because I was in so much pain. So I got kind of there. By the way, for as much woo as there is in nutrition science, if there's any any like other discipline that has more woo, it's pain science um, of people just saying it's completely nonsense and people believing it. Um, we used to think that your mind and body were kind of separate, right? Like your, your, your mind is the master control center and your body's a bag of meat, right? And if you poke the bag or punch the bag or burn the bag or cut the bag, your brain goes owie, yeah. right? Except it doesn't really work that way. Pain is more like an emotion. So I've, I'm not a pain expert. This is what I'm pulling from people who are experts and from some of the studies I've read. Okay. Um, so like, for example, some people will say, so you're telling me if I got shot, it wouldn't hurt. Depends. There are soldiers who get shot with non-mortal wounds who don't know they've been shot till later because they're so goal orientated that then their, their adrenaline is so high. They don't feel it. Right. Um, by same token, there are people who lose limbs who have pain where they don't even have a limb. They call well, it phantom pain. Well, yeah. When it's gone though. Right. Yeah. Right. But like, they're not feeling it here. They feel, they it, feel it here. here. But imagine that's gone. Right. Yeah. So the other thing is uh, people kind of, uh, let's, let's take bulging. And Maybe someone cut my hand off and my hand hurts. Like dog, you don't have a hand. Right. Okay. Holy so, shit. yeah. So let's take a uh, bulging disc and herniated disc, right? So people assume, all right, you have a bulging disc, herniated disc, you have back pain. Um, they took, I think it was Americans over age 40 who did not have back pain. Did you know that over half of them had herniated and bulged discs? Asymptomatic. So, so... <clears throat> So basically what you're saying is David Goggins got it right. <laughs> That's what you're saying. It's well, like not necessarily. So pain is more like an emotion and there are certain things that can, they referred in this paper I read to pain as like a gate. Okay. And there are certain things that will lower or raise your gate. So, um, for example, 
this is really going to piss some people off. But the research on like static stretching, reducing injuries, it, it pretty much doesn't exist. Oh. Um, here, here's what reduces injury risk. Um, not being under recovered. Um, did you know psychological stress raises your risk of injury? That makes sense. Um, sure. Lack of sleep. So they did a, a study where I think it was in army uh, people in might have been army rangers, but I'm not sure. Uh, but they like four versus eight hours of sleep. Guess how much it increased injury risk? Two hundred and thirty percent from that much less sleep from from four hours less sleep a night. Um, Holy shit! You know so, and you can have tissue damage with no pain and pain with no tissue damage. Okay, so these things are very complicated. And um, so people ask me like, how'd you fix your, your herniated disc? I don't know if I did. If you MRI my back now, they're probably still there, you know, but you can desensitize yourself to pain. You can also sensitize yourself to pain. So actually one of the most effective ways to decrease pain is through what's called exposure therapy. Now, you may have heard of this in kind of like a psychological sense or like um, a therapy sense, right? So let's use the example of like a spider. Okay, let's say you have a fear of spiders. Okay, like a, like a really bad one. If I put you, if I'm like, well, we're just going to get you over this right now. And I put you in a room filled with spiders. You are not going to get over it. That's going to be a traumatic event, <laughs> right? So that's like um, if you have some really bad back pain and you go, no, I'm going to plow through it, and you go and try and squat heavy, over time, you will actually sensitize yourself more to that pain, right? You'll feel it more, yeah. You'll, oh, it'll be yeah. way more painful. You're not necessarily causing more damage, but you're perceiving more pain because this is all crosstalk between your brain and body, okay? But you can also desensitize yourself through exposure therapy, which is like, okay, if you had a fear of spiders, what we might do is, okay, Bradley... We're going to have you sit here. I'm going to have a spider in a glass case on the other side of that room. And over time, we move that glass case closer, right? To the point where eventually... You care less. You become more comfortable with it. So how do we do this in regards to the body? So Because people always, I got injury, I got this. How do we do that in regards to the body? So, and again, I would recommend people, you know, work with a qualified sports physical therapist who's used to working with athletes if this is, you know, because they're the professionals. Yeah. Um. So for, I'll give you an example. In 2000, from 2016 to 2020, I dealt with like hip pain in both hips on and off to the, where it started out, it was like kind of painful to, by the time I kept trying to plow through it, I couldn't even squat the like 135 below parallel without like 10 out of 10 pain. And in 16 weeks from starting exposure therapy, I basically got to a tolerable pain level for full squatting. So now, what did you do? So here's what I did. So with exposure therapy, you want to kind of, essentially you're trying to touch that pain just a little bit without making it worse, okay? So you don't want to have your threshold be absolutely no pain whatsoever. So if you've been lifting long enough, I think you and I know, like we know when we got a little, like a little pain that like For sure. we can kind of work through it and we're not going to make it worse. We also know when there's the, oh, sh like that's bad. And if I keep going, it's going to get worse. Yeah. So it does take some like practice and experience. But what I did was I found, okay, full squatting was out. Like I just couldn't do it. And like, I tried modifying tempo. Like even if I went slow, it was still painful. Even if I decreased the weight, it was still painful. So then I was like, okay, can I limit the range of motion? And I found that I could do a, a pin squat about, five, six inches above parallel, slow to pins, pause, come back up with a low to tolerable amount of pain, right? And so... Like out of 10, like a four? Like a three or a four, yeah. Okay. So I started there, right? And I did kind of like a normal workout that I would do. And then if that went okay, the next week or... Not always the next week, but it was like, okay, can I lower the pin? And it was like probably, you know, my best squat 
I mean, I was doing this for like sets of three to five, but my best squats for like my, I think my best squat I ever did for a set of five was 600 pounds. Um, Which is incredible. But like, especially here, being a fake natty. <laughs> but <laughs> my, like here I'm doing like 400, you know, for a three to five. Yeah. To like six inches above parallel, right? Like this You're trying is, to work through this, it. This is, yeah, this is pretty light and high for me. Um, but over, over time, it's like, okay, can I lower the pins? I can increase the weight a little bit, you know? And then if I felt like, okay, that pain's a little bit more than I feel like, then I would regress it for a week and then try and go back. Cause recovery isn't really linear. I don't know how many injuries you've dealt with, but you know, you know, when you're coming back, like sometimes it gets worse and then it continues to get better. Like yeah. it's not necessarily a linear process. So, you know, I just kind of embraced, all right, when I feel good and I feel like I can lower those pins, I'll do it when I don't feel good, then I'll just hold steady, you know, okay. in over 16 weeks, I basically got to where the point where I could do a full squat, slow tempo to like a three or four out of pain. But when I started, it was a nine or 10. So you have to kind of, obviously you have to gauge this by your own accord, essentially, right. but it's gotta, the range of motion is what you're saying is, well, that it's not always sometimes like, for example, I've been able to like, if I'm not like so sensitized to it, I've been able to just slow down the tempo and like that makes it tolerable, right? Got it. So I'll tell people like if you have to modify, like let's say you're you're if like take my case of a power lifter, right? Bodybuilding is way more malleable. Like there's so many ways to build yeah, muscle. You could just like, go do leg press and go, it doesn't hurt my back at all. Exactly. You know? Like yeah. just there's and the research shows you can, I mean, build basically as much muscle doing machines as you can free weights. So yeah. like the world is your oyster in bodybuilding. Yeah. Um and even like isolation versus compound the research suggests you can still build about the same amount of muscle. Yeah. Um, but in powerlifting, I mean, you know, if you want to get better at squat, bench press and deadlift, you have you to do it. Got to do those lifts at some point. Yeah. So, um, you know, the first thing I'd recommend, like, okay, if you're having pain, that's, you know, more consistently more than like a five out of 10. Okay. Lower the weight a little bit. Does that help? If that doesn't do it, Lower the weight, slow the tempo down. Okay, that doesn't do it. Try um, lowering the weight, slowing the tempo, and doing a pause. That doesn't do it. Lower the weight, slow tempo, pause, and modify the range of motion. And if all those things don't work, then you got to regress. <laughs> you're, you, you're done, dude. Then you got to regress to a different exercise yeah. until you can build your tolerance back. Back up. to that. The I think the mistake a lot of people make is it's like what I used to do, which is either okay, well I can't train, so I've just stopped training. Or I try to plow through it. It was yeah. like two speeds, right? Yeah. And so, man, I think about like, I probably wasted, not wasted, but I probably spent five years where I could have been still really competitive just doing this up down of going through, like dealing with all this pain because as soon as I got to the point where, you know, I'd, I'd come out, I'd, I'd pretty much do nothing or I'd stop squatting completely. And then I would start again and I'd be like, okay, I feel good. Go hard. Here we are again. Yeah. You know? Whereas if I had just, when that pain had initially happened, now, like, I tell people, so I, I won uh, Masters Worlds for my weight class and age uh, in 2022 for the IPF. Yeah. Um, and I won Nationals again this year um, for the IPF affiliate, which IPF is basically the IFBB of powerlifting. And... I dealt with back pain on and off during that time. Like it flares up and like my coach and I, and he's great. His name's Zach Robinson. He actually is doing his PhD in exercise science, really smart guy also competes himself. And he said it, he's like, listen, as we get into ramping you up for worlds, like this stuff is going to rear its head and we just have to be ready. And we know the formula for this. And so the formula was okay. When my back pain would get to an intolerable level because as the volume's coming up and the intensity is coming up as we're trying to peak for this, we would treat it very aggressively. So, you know, initially rest and we would like basically back the weight way off. And then we would build volume and intensity through something like belt, belt squats where I'm, where my back's not hurting. Less pressure right? on, the belt, on the back. Yeah. And honestly, within one, two weeks, I'd be back going hard again. And it was like just being 
just keeping myself mobile and doing some active recovery, huge difference. Whereas before it'd be like, I've got to plow through this or just completely rest. And you don't want to just completely rest either because what happens, and I didn't realize I was doing this to myself, is even if I completely rest, let's say eight weeks, right? Go back in the gym. I'm still really strong squatter. Like not as strong as I was, but I'm still really strong. And if I have not been practicing technique during that time, yeah. guess what I'm likely to do? Hurt yourself again. And I've detrained. So my recovery, like you, you're, as you train more, your body recovers faster over yeah. time. Because like everybody remembers, like first time you ever did legs, you restore for like 10 days, you know? And I got to the point where I was training squats like four times a week, right? Um, my body built up to that recovery level. So when you detrain, now your recovery isn't as fast and your, your technique is not as good. You're actually more likely to re-injure yourself going back right. in, right? Right. So, and even like the other things that don't seem to make much of a difference for injury risk is like, so everybody was, you know, big on, you got to have a straight back deadlifting, got to have a straight back deadlifting. Uh, so the yeah, research doesn't really support it, to be honest. Like, but don't you want your back to be not bent? If it's a mechanical advantage for you, then yes. Uh, but some people have a better mechanical advantage, certainly with a rounded upper back. Yeah. Um, but some people even have, and you see some people who, I mean, like cat back deadlift, deadlift a lot of weight and don't seem to get injured more than other people. Yeah. But here, and here's, I actually but started. they're cheating. Aren't they normally doing the sumo? <laughs> All right, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheating, dude. Isn't it cheating? Okay, so I'll, let me finish this thought okay, and then okay. I'll get to the, the sumo is cheating. Okay. So I actually started training myself with a little bit more of a rounded back, and here's why. Because I, um, I found that when I got heavy and was in a fatigued state, I would start out straight and then my back would round and that's when I would get injured. Because if you have not trained those tissues in that position, yeah, um, you're going to, like, the injury risk is higher. And so you're better off if you are going to end up in that position to train Always that position. Train through that way, right? yeah. I mean, one of the best squatters, sorry, the best squatter, female squatter in the world at 63 kilos is Leah Boy Boyatelli. I, I think I pronounced her last name right. Sorry, Leah. Uh, um, so she's 140-ish pounds and squats on like 470, yeah, right? Now, when she does it, she's very narrow stance and her knees go like this, right? And everybody's like, you're going to blow out your knees, you're going to blow out. She's never had knee problems. She's always squatted that way. Those tissues are used to that sort of stress. Now, if she always squatted knees out and then gets heavy and goes knees in, she then there problems. is an increased yeah. risk. Okay. So now your question about is sumo cheating? Yeah. All right. So in research studies where they have people pull conventional or pull sumo, they don't see a significant difference in one rep maximums. Um, they also see similar activation of muscles. Now, the, the one difference is lumbar spine has a bigger activation in the conventional. Um, and I believe glutes and quads have more of an activation in the sumo, I believe, if I remember the research correctly. Um, but here's the thing. If sumo was easier, every single powerlifter would do it. Every single one. No, no, I don't care what anybody but, says. But isn't nobody's trying to make it harder on themselves? Yeah, but isn't but, it isn't it just the way you're built then at that point? So it is, and but also consider this. So uh, and people like get on me, but I'm like, uh, you guys don't know this, but back in like 2009, I pulled 700 conventional. There's a video you can find on my YouTube if you go all the way back. It's a good. That's a good pull. Um, and my best, my best um, sumo at a similar body weight is 716. So it's very similar, pretty close, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the reason I switched to sumo was because I just found that conventional plus a lot of squatting, my lower back was so fatigued all the time, you know? So I just found that I could handle more squat volume if I did sumo. I see. Um, I would say 
there are more powerlifters that pull sumo than pull conventional. Um, so it does appear at a top level that your top end strength, that you're at the top level of powerlifters probably favors sumo, but not all. There's plenty of guys who pull conventional who are stronger and conventional. Um, and a lot of it boils down to the trade-offs. So here's the trade-off. If I ask you to jump as high as you can, are you going to get into a sumo stance? No. no, because you have the most power when your feet are directly under you. Yeah. But with sumo, you're reducing the range of motion, right? So it's that trade-off. You're, you're giving up power for less range of motion. But like I said, if sumo is easier, every single power lifter would do it. So, but you would, you would argue that conventional is more, uh, not in, not in for this specific thing, but it translates to other things better then. Um, well, so like if we're talking about athletes, I'd probably just have them do a trap bar dead. You know what I mean? Um, Cause of safety. Well, I just, it's, it's when you're, Dealing with athletes who, you know, I lift to get better at lifting, right? Not like most athletes, which lift to get better at their sport, right? right? You're just worried about, like, getting more lean mass and getting somebody stronger. Who gives a shit if they're stronger at a trap bar deadlift compared to a conventional deadlift, Yeah, right? they're competing in that. Exactly. So I would do that just because it's like, to get somebody to be a really proficient like free bar squatter or conventional deadlifter or even a sumo deadlifter, it takes a lot of time and work. But most people can pick up a trap bar and get pretty decent at it pretty quick. Right? Yeah, I see. So if you're looking at your time investment with an athlete, does it make sense to try and get them to learn all these really complicated lifts that are, require a high degree of specificity and training that, by the way, maybe they end up injuring themselves on because they haven't had that much training on them? No, it makes sense to give them stuff that they can pick up pretty quickly. Yeah, you know? it's fair. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, again, it, it just it just depends on, on what you're going for. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, and even in powerlifting, their top-end conventional might be better than their top-end sumo, but the problem is, you know, you're fatigued from squatting by the time you're done. Um, this happened with the guy... Um, I beat, his name is Michael Garazzo. I beat him at Nationals, and then he beat me at North Americans by a single pound because he had the last pull. That'd be terrible. I would hate to lose by one pound. <laughs> I would be so it fucking It actually was mad. a really interesting, uh, I'll get into it here in a second, but anyways, he pulled conventional at Nationals because he's like, my best pull was conventional, but by the time I got to you know, deadlifts, after my second pull, my, I was blown, you know? Yeah. But then at... Um, North Americans doing sumo, he just felt like he had more endurance, more in the tank. Um, and that's been my experience too. So, um, yeah, that was an interesting situation because the meets were eight weeks apart. And I had, I had a great meet. I went nine for nine. I hit great numbers on all my lifts. And so this is where powerlifting is actually does have quite a bit of strategy to it in, in certain uh, particular circumstances. So when you weigh in, there's what's called lot numbers. And a lot number almost never matters. So if you have a lower lot number, you weigh in earlier. Higher lot number, you weigh in later, right? Well, you would say, well, the lower lot number is the advantage because you can weigh in and then you've got more time to rehydrate and get some food in, yeah. right? Um, but here's where lot number matters. If two people pick the same weight, the higher lot number will go second. Okay, so... Mike and I are tied. I think we were tied going into the last deadlift. So whatever number I choose, he's just going to put the same number plus one down. No, plus. he's going to put the same number. Here's why. Cause if I miss, he can just back it down to whatever he needs to beat me and do it. Oh, that's annoying. And if I hit, he can just add a half kilo chip it and beat me that way. Right. And so it's actually a much more difficult decision for me and my coach. It almost goes back to that placebo thing we said, too, where it's like, well, he did that. I'm going to do this. <laughs> how much harder is it to pull one more pound? But, you know, in, in our case, my coach and I, Ben's great. Um, and, and, and Mike's game day coach was uh, Susie Gary, who's legendary. Uh, we're looking at, OK, we have to pick a number that we feel like is really going to push him. But it's also going to push me. Right. So we have to do something that we're 
we think I can hit, but it's going to be a stretch. Kind of right? uncertainty. Because yeah. we're pretty close on pretty much every lift. And um, so Ben picked uh, 706 pounds. He's my game day coach. And uh, he was like, you know, I was like 60, 40, 60. I didn't think you were going to get it. I'm like, child, please. Um, so I go out and get it. <laughs> Mike puts on 707, gets it and wins it. You know, you should have gave him the, the clear pre-workout. You should have took the pre <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, no. So anyway, like um, I'm kind of indulging myself here because of my own competition. No, no, it's fair. It's, it's fair. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the things I actually enjoy about powerlifting is there's actually a lot more strategy to it than people think at a, at a high level where there's a lot of competition. Yeah. So so switching gears a little bit, a little, obviously still about nutrition, but I know this is the corny question that everyone is going to want certain answers to but i gotta ask this what do you think are the most important supplements when it comes to performance okay and then we'll do second important supplements when it comes to building muscle mass okay they're so all like pretty, similar they're all pretty similar yeah but i just want to let's get your take on it all right quick interrupt for the podcast this is for all my sleepless sleepers all right these are for all the boys who they lay in bed and they wake up, and they wake up, and they're like, oh, my sleep was bad. And they would complain to their friend, they're like, man, my sleep was bad. And your other friend's like, your sleep was bad. There's a solution, okay, hostage state. Check this out. You may not understand this, but don't even think so hard about it. Just know that your body's ability to like recover, your efficiency in sleep, like your alertness, everything during the day, like if you're breathing through your nose, ah, it's gonna be 10 times better. 10 times better than breathing through your mouth. Mouth breathers, efficiency oxygen wise, not great. Breath smelling, you're gonna have like breath smell, like you're, you're gonna be drool, like probably drool over your bed. I was one of those guys, I'm not gonna lie, I was one of those guys, I'm like waking up, and I'm like, oh, and like this, and it's like, but even like going down here, you could fix all that and make your sleep better. Like honestly, why not? Like it's gonna make you better athletically, mentally, clear, everything focused better. Like sleep is 100% one of the most important things for anyone, for any goal, physically, like mentally, if your sleep is f everything you do is going to be just less. I mean, that's that's an undeniable fact, okay? Hostage take for all the mouth breathers. Get better sleep, sleep more, wake up more rested, all that good stuff. I love it. I've actually did I did it for a while, and I said this before, but I did it for a while. I thought I had sleep apnea because, like, when I was bigger, I was, like, waking up in the middle of the night. I was getting terrible sleep, like, waking up in the middle of the night. So I started covering my mouth and started making sure my nose was always clear and I was getting incredible sleep, feeling better in the gym, better in life, everything. So, so if you guys want to give it a shot, go to hostagetape.com slash raw talk, buy two, get one free right now. Uh, more forever, hold your peace. What? What's this? So you laughing because I got the pain in my head? No, you fucking like slammed the dash on his fucking just hilarious. Yeah, I didn't mean to. It's just a fucking, it's a little fucking idea there. So. Oh my God. Yeah. Let's get back into this podcast, oh. dude. So I'm going to do a slight variation off that if it's okay. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I, I have my supplements in tiers. So I have a first tier, which is very confident recommending these hundreds of studies across multiple countries over decades of research. I have a feeling I know these are going to be. Go for it. Creatine, yeah. caffeine, whey protein. That is your Mount Rushmore of supplements right there. Boom. There's just so much research data to show that, hey, these things work, Right. Now, second tier would be things like, a um, good example would be like ashwagandha. Yeah. Um, something that it's like, you know, we have studies, a couple studies showing it improves lean mass. We have studies showing it modestly increases testosterone, lowers cortisol. I just want to see it over a longer period of time across more labs and just consistency, right? But I'm pretty bullish on it. And that's why it's, you know, it's, it's in some of my products yeah. or it's in my recovery product. Um, that uh, rhodiola would also fit in that category. Um, both of those are adaptogens. Yeah. So adaptogens basically like help your body manage stress essentially. Yeah. Um, and so ashwagandha tends to be a little more on the relaxant side, whereas rhodiola tends to be more on the stimulant performance side. So ashwagandha tends to improve recovery. Um, you see modest increases in testosterone, decreases in cortisol and improvements in sleep. Rhodiola, you tend to see better exercise performance and cognition. Um, so it seems to increase neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Um, and not only do you see improvements in like um, fatigue, but also perception of fatigue. And what's cool about rhodiola is you see like um, physical, it helps you handle physical stress better. It also like, I think it reduces soreness as well. But psychological stress as well. 
So there was a clinical study where they uh, gave rhodiola and uh, actually saw improvements in symptoms of depression in people with mild to moderate depression. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not suggesting yeah. that rhodiola is a cure for depression or that you can stop your antidepressants if you're somebody who's on antidepressants or whatever best practices are out there. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying in this, this population, it seemed to improve those a little bit. Yeah. So it seems to help with physical and psychological stress. But in both of those cases, the mechanisms aren't really well understood. Now, we already talked about I'm bigger on outcomes than I am on mechanisms, right? But I do think it is important to, if something is working, we should understand why it works, right? Like we know why creatine works. We know why whey protein works. We know why caffeine works. So they're starting to get more of that research going. So I want to see more of that research before I say, you know, this is going to move up to my, you know, tier one. Uh, and then things like uh, citrulline, uh, beta alanine, um, betaine or trimethylglycine would be on that list. TMG. Um, and, you know, people who's, who see this may say, well, he's got a conflict of interest because all those things are in the supplements. Well, you, of course you'd make supplements. Yeah, yeah have because, the good I, stuff in I'm it. Like, because I take this stuff and I think that this is the stuff that works. Uh, yeah. Melatonin would be on that list as well. Really? Um, yeah. So there was actually a study where they gave melatonin and they actually saw improvements in lean mass. Um, and interestingly, you know, my first thought was like, this is probably secondary to they're just sleeping better and recovering better and having better performance in the gym. But some people have argued that there might be a mechanism for it even outside of that. Um, in, so, in relationship to what? Like, Well, we're not sure, but there... I, I can't remember what it was, okay. but somebody suggested that maybe there's um, like a melatonin receptor in other places. I would love to see how it affects uh, protein metabolism. Like we have seen that like, you know, even acute sleep deprivation can affect performance, uh, appetite, um, even a 14 day study where they had people sleep restrict. So they were, had people on a calorie deficit. One group was sleep restricted. I want to say it was five and a half hours or less. Another group getting over eight hours. The group getting over eight hours lost almost all their weight from fat. They didn't lose, they didn't have a difference in weight loss. The group that was sleep restricting, almost half of their weight loss was from lean mass. What so, the f Yeah. So um, recovery is a big thing. Again, this is the shit that be, it, it kind of boils down. People don't want to hear this stuff because it's like, you know, tell me how I can sleep four hours and still get jacked as hell, you know? Yeah. And like, listen, you can find people who sleep very little who are jacked, but the, the, the point I'm making is they'd probably be more jacked if they got more sleep, yeah. right? And so, um, uh, you know, I do think melatonin can help. Now, I will tell people like, hey, like I know for me, if I want to go to sleep at like 10, 1030, I'm probably taking my melatonin at like eight. Um, and I use about two milligrams. That's what's in my supplement. You don't need a bunch. If I take like five, 10 milligrams, like right before I go to sleep, I am absolutely groggy the next day. Like I, I feel it. It spills um, over, you say? Uh, it, anecdotally for me, yes. Okay. Um, so I think there is something to like, you know, kind of an optimal dose, you know, a U-shaped curve, maybe different for different people. I know some people will, will take, oh shit, there it is. Uh, I know some people that will take, so I took my melatonin before I came in. <laughs> you go to bed soon? I'm on East Coast time, baby. Yeah. Um, I do know some people who can take five, 10, even 20 milligrams and, and, not have negative effects. And I think there is a, a tolerance thing that does happen. You know, there was a, I want to say I read a study one time where they were giving like a hundred milligrams of melatonin and that sounds toxic. Uh, I wasn't toxic. Um, uh, but they still saw like improvements in sleep, but I would love to like see well, like yeah. short term how those people but have you felt. ever had any weird melatonin dreams? I, I, I very rarely dream. Oh, very really? And they're, they're like, really basic. Damn. It's like I've I had do, like some weird ass dreams on melatonin. I couldn't imagine a hundred. Every, every once in a while I have like a dream that it's not just like I'm running or I'm falling or, you know, <laughs> doing something else. Um, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll have a, like a semi more complicated dream, but I just, I just don't dream that much or I dream and I just don't remember it. Yeah. You know, that's see. another thing. A lot of people do dream and just don't remember what they dreamt. Um, 
so yeah, I'm, I I like melatonin. Um, theanine, another thing that that may have some some good. Um, not really necessarily a sleep aid, but kind of a, a relaxant and like an anti anxiety sort of effect. Yeah. Um, and, and th- there's more things I could put on that list, but it's not. I don't want to say about it's like exhausting. fish oil. Fish oil or... would be on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, good multivitamin would probably be on there. Um, but yeah, you know, unfortunately, like this stuff is is not sexy, right? Um, yeah. But what I tell people is like, you know, people get ho hum about oh creatine monohydrate. It's like, well, there's a reason it's cheap and it's boring because everyone makes it because it's been around forever because it works. Yeah. It never went out of style. Like, look at... Do you remember when it was like a stick to everyone? <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. That was good. I remember when I started, to, I took it... Oh, you take creatine? Oh, that's 16, like... 16 and my parents were like, oh man. Yeah. Um, it's pretty funny. It is, it is funny. Um, and actually like, there's a lot of research that su- suggests creatine might actually be really healthy. Yeah, like, I think um, it's good for your brain as well. Yeah, there there's, appears to be some real cognitive benefits to it. Yeah. Um, and it, honestly, it is the safest, most effective yeah. supplement that we have tons of data on. The one thing that people will say is, oh, it causes hair loss. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So there was one study in 2009 that didn't show hair loss. It showed an increased DHT. Now, this study has never been replicated. And DHT is, um, I believe, a metabolite of testosterone. And, but their testosterone, so the precursor, so they measured DHT, the precursor, and the metabolite of DHT in this study. The testosterone, the precursor and the metabolite didn't change, only DHT, which to me is kind of weird. Um, so you're basically saying through some unknown mechanism, creatine increases the synthesis of DHT in this one mechanism. So I'm not really sold on creatine causing hair loss. Um and like I said, it was a study from almost 15 years ago that has never been replicated. So I I don't want to say it doesn't cause hair loss, but I don't think there's really good evidence that it does. Yeah, I love creatine. I think it's dope. I just recently started taking it again. But again, like, so let's take, um, for example, you know what's funny? If I can remember back in the early 2000s, HMB, colostrum, yep. ectosterone, yeah. What's coming back into vogue now? God damn it, dude. All that shit. It's just like, it's weird. It's how TikTok has, oh, Ashwagandha. It's like, bro, Ashwagandha has been around forever. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden I was like, two years ago, I was like, this is the every, this is the best shit out there. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's the internet, dude. The cycles of things. Yeah. That's, it's like fashion, right? Well, even pyruvate is coming back. Like, so it's funny because it's, it's kind of like companies don't make money on creatine monohydrate because it, it's like big screen TVs, right? You remember, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, I remember I bought my first, like, flat screen, like, TV. Yeah, you were balling TV, God damn. 42-inch uh, Philips flat screen for, like, almost $1,000. Bro, you get a 40-inch screen TV for a pack of bubble gum right yeah, now. Yeah, like 100 like, bucks? Yeah, for nothing, right? <laughs> Why? Because the market is so competitive because l- every company makes it, and, and it's just gotten easy to manufacture because it's yeah. so ubiquitous, right? Yeah. Same thing for creatine. Everyone sells it. So, hey, how can we make some more money? Oh, creatine ethyl ester. Oh, buffer <laughs> creatine. Oh, yeah. Creatine whatever, you know? And I'm like, hey, just in the case of creatine ethyl ester, the, the, the two research studies that were actually on it showed it was actually quite a bit worse than regular creatine. It, it is weird, though, how it's like it's become this like race to just sell. Like, dude, I think the people who did it almost the craziest before social media ever really was a thing was T nation. They were selling single item products for like crazy prices. I was like, Holy, I remember you read these, like these articles they would put, this is before social media and influencers were like, buy, this is my favorite. But they wrote, they wrote these really compelling articles. And I was like, I need that. Yep. They have all these graphs and shit. I was like, these motherfuckers got me. Yeah. And it was the most simple. Well, and even it's, you know, and so now, now it's coming back to like, Social media influencers are like, this is the best. Shit. And it's like, so it's like, buy it from this company at this price. When it's like, yo, that costs like this much. 
over here. You just buy it over here. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, even like, again, ectosterone getting popular again. But you didn't hear about ectosterone for like 10 years, right? Yeah. Creatine never went out of style. Whey protein never went out of style. Caffeine never went out of style. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because those f- things work, you know? And so, you know, I tell people like, hey, just look at the stuff that sticks around. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, I get it. It's hard to make money off this, the, these things. And so people feel like they got to be novel or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so they try and reinvent the wheel. But the shit that works is the shit that works, you know, yeah. and it's it's as you get to people who have been around longer, the list of supplements I take has dwindled significantly. It has not expanded, you know, um, I have hope that, you know, we'll find more stuff. That what do you think about Alpha GPC? A um, couple studies showing improved performance. Um, I, I used to have it in my old pre-workout. Um, I think. We need more research. It's somewhat promising. I just decided to keep it out in favor of stuff that I felt like was more, uh, had more research to support it. Yeah, I love Alpha GPC. Um, what about nicotine? So that's something, um, there's a negative connotation around nicotine. Yeah, um, big time. Hugely, obviously, because of the cigarettes. Right. But if you look at, I mean, the, I think the vaping literature has made this very clear. It's the smoke itself that's really negative because yeah. even vaping raises your risk of lung cancer, cardiovascular disease seems to be a little bit better than like regular cigarettes, cigarettes, um, vapes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They can still raise risk. Um, so it's like people like ask me about marijuana. I'm like edibles, kitties, edibles better than smoking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just smoking is just, you know, it seems just to be not act good for literally you. of smoking period. Yeah. 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 It appears to be. Uh, and listen, I love a good cigar every now and then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh yeah. Um, but you know, I it's not good for me. I know that. Yeah. Um, so, but people thought, oh well, there's nicotine in this stuff, and so nicotine must be bad. It's only bad in that you know, like caffeine, it's a stimulant. It seems to be a, a very good nootropic, like yeah. cognitive enhancer. Uh, in fact, one of my best friends, um, he doesn't take caffeine because it bothers his his GI. Um, but man, he's got a thing of, of the pouches and he's yeah. always, he's always got a Zen in, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot, yeah. And as far as nicotine itself doesn't appear to have much negative literature on it, other yeah. than the fact that you can kind of become dependent on it, much like you could become dependent on caffeine, you know? So what I would say is seems to be a pretty good cognitive enhancer. Yeah. So it's just like, isn't it more so the way which you are, the application of it and how you're getting it? Yeah, and keep in mind, like, it was in cigarettes because people liked the feeling that they would get from a cigarette or, you know, whatever. They also, also, people who smoke cigarettes, like, Jacob, my God, he, he stopped recently. He thought he looked cool doing it. Because <laughs> he, he fits the vibe. He got the tattoo. He got a snake tattoo, dude. The uh-huh. guy has a snake tattoo, so he's like, I look cool doing this shit. Oh, he's trolling for the snake tattoo, but no. <laughs> but, but, so, yeah. I Because nicotine, dude... Recently, I was I was joking around and I was like, I'm going to I was like, I'm going to get addicted to nicotine to beat the addiction <laughs> um, just because I just wanted something to overcome. And did you, you know, um, so I'm not saying I'm fully addicted to it, but I do when it's around, I guess this is, a, this is when you start to get addicted. You're like, hmm, I don't need that, but I could sure take it. Yeah. And it's starting to get there. And, and uh, I think once I get fully addicted, then I'll, I'll reel it back and see how hard it is to get. Is it hard, very hard to get off nicotine? You, I'm assuming you don't know. I don't, I don't know, uh, personally. Um, it probably just depends. I mean, it's hard for me to get off caffeine. So, oh, yeah, yeah well, that's hard. 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 But, but I, like, I, like the, I like the mental stimulus in it. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's why my friend likes it, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a different type of. And I'm not at all trying to get people, convincing people to take this stuff like. I'm not like, trust me, it is an addictive chemical. I know that for sure. Um, but it is different. It's like this like calm, clear sort of focus mm-hmm. versus like caffeine sometimes to me can feel in higher amounts. It can feel like somewhat like fluttery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like jittery. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm probably a bad example. Like I've tried the, the nicotine pouches cause Mike's like, dude, you gotta try this. My brain, it's so hard for me to stay on one thing. You can probably tell by the way I talk, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm like yeah. Ooh, this thing and this thing and this thing. Um, and so I'm probably a bad person to ask about like nicotine or caffeine or whatever, 
Because, dude, I could take 300 milligrams of caffeine and go to sleep. Yeah, you know, that's like, insane. That's yeah. like, I can't even drink caffeine past five o'clock. I won't go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sensitive. Yeah, and, and I mean, to be fair, it probably does. It probably, if I did that, I could sleep, but it would impact my sleep quality. Like, there's, yeah. there's actually some pretty compelling evidence that even like, even though the, the half life of caffeine is like six hours, that if you have, I think it was something like 300 milligrams of caffeine in the morning, it still can negatively affect your sleep like 12, 13 hours later. Yeah. Like your sure. sleep quality. So RIP my afternoon workouts. You know? Yeah. <laughs> have, have you ever, I, I know you, the natty thing, have you ever considered steroids or would you ever take them? So I got this, I got this question the other day and, um, you know, it's going to sound very, people are going to be like, oh, bullshit. Um, not really. Um, only because I never really had the desire to kind of look like a cartoon character. <laughs> I, I like the idea of competing. I yeah. like competing. But I had natural bodybuilding and I have, you know, powerlifting drug test. And I was like, oh, people can beat the test. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But, like, listen, first off, natural bodybuilding, like, there's five people in the show and there's no money. So like the incentive to cheat is pretty low. You Very know? low. Like if you cheat in that, you're, you're, I. What about Logan Paul boxing Dylan Dennis? Incentive to cheat there, pretty high? What's, oh yeah. And I don't know if he did, but I mean, it's a pretty high yeah, incentive pretty to high cheat. Incentive. Well, that's like, pretty, listen. Do you, how easy do you think it is to beat the P test? Uh, it depends on what kind of P test you're doing and, and like, are we talking? This was a just, Vada, Vada P test. Yeah. So if it's in competition, pretty easy because you know when to after get rid competition. Of it. Um, if it's random, no, that's, just right after. Yeah, I mean that's that's if somebody knows when if they know when they're getting tested. I mean, my understanding is it's pretty darn easy to beat. Yeah. Um, what's nice about the IPF is if you're one of the you know a world level lifter, you have to fill out a whereabouts form where basically they can give you an hour notice and show up and, and piss test you. Yeah. Um, and I've had it happen before. So I was actually at a seminar. Um, this is like 2016, I want to say. I was at a seminar in Virginia giving a seminar, and there was a meet next door. And they're like, oh, Lane's here. Hey, while you're here, pee in this cup. Piss in this cup. You know? And so, like, hey, there's no perfect way of doing things, but just that people know that they could at any time I think that's a, a pretty strong, you know, pretty strong deterrent. Yeah. And they do catch people. Um, but no, I, you know, for me, it was like, I just want to be able to compete at a high level, push myself, and I can do that without steroids. You don't think at some point, just health-wise, you might choose that? So I, I've had, ever since I've gotten my testosterone done, the lowest my testosterone has ever been uh, was 750. And it's been above 1,000 multiple times when I've had it tested as well. So I just don't need it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I'm, I'm good. And I have a lot of energy. Like, um, my, uh, my, my friend, uh, my best friend, Mike, he jokes, he's like, bro, when I'm around you for like three hours, I need a fucking nap afterwards. <laughs> he's like, you're like, you know, um, yeah. So more I just, mental energy than physical. I both, guess that's kind of both. Both. But like, dude, like I train, you know, my, my sessions are like two, three hours. If I didn't have that, dude, I'd be a fucking nut job. Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm just like, I got to get it out. I got to get out. Even like if I'm on the phone, I'm like pacing back and forth. Yeah. You know, I'm fidgeting. I'm moving my hands and stuff. I talk fast, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I think that, you know, I kind of got blessed with a pretty good engine. You know yeah. what I mean? But I also took care of myself as well. You know, I talk about that, like. You know, most people in their 20s, they went pretty hard, you know, with their partying and, you know, yeah. staying up late and stuff. And like, hey, I had my moments of that, you know, but I've literally like, I can count less times than on one hand, the amount of times that I've been drunk to the point where I felt sick or, you know, couldn't form coherent thoughts well, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I just never really beat my body up that much. And I always was good about like, if I wanted to go to sleep, I just went to sleep, you know, and, or if I just didn't want to go out and party I, with my friends, I just didn't do it, you know? Yeah. So I was always pretty protective about that kind of stuff. I joke, I, I've partied way more in my late thirties than I ever did in my twenties. Dude, know? me so, too. So I me think, too. I think. I never went out ever. Right. I've gone out more in the last two years than I have like in my whole life. Yeah. So I, I think that like that helped as well, you know, and probably a little bit of genetics as well. So, yeah. but Hey, like, okay. 
let's say five years from now, um, I'm feeling low energy, my libido's in the trash, um, and I go and get measured, my testosterone's down. Would I consider it if it was negatively impacting my quality of life? Of course I would. Yeah. You know, like I, there's no judgment here. Like yeah. me choosing to not take steroids is not me saying, hey, all you guys who take steroids, you're all cheaters and pieces of shit. No, like I got plenty of friends who are on TRT or, yeah. or, or on steroids or whatever that are perfectly great people. Yeah. You know, like to me, I don't really know what you put in your own body, you know, yeah. but when it comes down to competition, uh, here's the other thing. It's easy for me to say this because powerlifting, bodybuilding, you have a choice. You can compete non-tested, right? So in my mind, if you choose, if you have the choice to compete tested or non-tested and you're like purposely trying to cheat the tests, like, come on. Like, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. You know? Because bodybuilding um, is, is like, it's pretty understood that it's in that sport. Right. Untested. Right. Yeah. So go compete there. Right. right? Um, but... I am not judging somebody in Major League Baseball who's the backup shortstop who's making a million bucks a year, maybe knowing the guy in front of him is on the sauce making $20 million a year. Yeah. Like, it's easy for me to be high and mighty about it when it's not my money on the line, you know? Yeah, I get it. So, and I'm, hey, listen, I'm not saying all Major League Baseball players cheat or all professional athletes cheat. I think... Um, I think they do. <laughs> and I think they, I think they <laughs> should, right? Like, we, I was having this conversation with, like, Another guy, but a sports uh, fighting commentator guy, but he because we were talking about in regards to fighting, it's a little different, I think, because it's like you're at, no, it was a guy named Wade, but it's because okay. we're they're actually hitting each other. It's a little different when you have like that much more power or strength in a in a martial art. It could just be more detrimental to the oh, yeah. to the fighters' brains. Well, dude, basically, I mean, like that's that's people like like man, you know, aren't you worried about what's gonna happen to your body later with powerlifting? I'm like. I'm like, dude, powerlifting is really not that bad, like hard on you. Like, yeah, like I'm going to have some aches and pains, but show me s somebody who's 60 who doesn't have pain. I'll right. be good luck, right? right. Um, you can be strong and have pain or you can be weak and have pain. You choose, Yeah. you know? But like combat sports, bro. I mean, there's like, real rep repercussions to your dude, fucking... Dude, that's why I, I just... NFL football. Like people be like, oh, this guy's holding out, this and that. I'm like... Hey man, first off, average career is like three years and they are losing years off of their life, yeah. most likely, and probably some significant cognitive decline in those later years. So let them get their money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they're paying a pretty steep price. And even like, I mean, look at people talk about, again, people talk about powerlifting is hard in your body, but look at golfers, man. Look at Tiger Woods swinging a club. Bro, if you do, if you push something to the limit, there's going to be a price to pay for it, you know. Um, bowlers, you go your shoulders up. Yeah, yeah. Pitchers, you know, elbow, shoulder. Like, it's just you know, you push your. Whenever you get to that high a level, what it takes to make progress, further progress, is almost always going to be right next to what's going to get you injured. Yeah. You know, because you're always pushing that limit of your recovery to just get a little bit more. You know, this is why when people are like, oh, you know, these guys are like, you know, you actually just one set, you know, you, you, you know, just do less. That's how the secret to gains. I'm like, in what other area of life is that actually true? It doesn't exist. Talking about like one giant set when the giant well, set like guys. The, these folks who are like, oh, training volume doesn't matter. It's all about just taking one set to failure, you know, like a hit is kind of having a comeback now. And I'm like, okay, but here's like all these meta analyses that show that like volume is a pretty strong predictor of long-term hypertrophy. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think people like misinterpret sometimes cause they'll, they'll, a lot of times people come to hit because two reasons they might've been over, they might've been overreaching for their current recovery level at that time, gone back to doing, like less started to see progress. Well, it's not because of that one set. It's because you actually, your body's not recovering and you're actualizing some of those gains. Right. Yeah. Also some people like doing multiple hard sets of compound lifts is very taxing. 
Like I'll tell people like, oh, like, oh you trained a seven, eight RPE on your squats. I'm like, yeah, come train with me. Go, go ahead. Come train with me doing, I don't know, like back in my, in my prime, when I, when I set the world squat record, I was doing like 20 to 30 plus sets of over 500 pound squats for reps per week. Yeah. You know, like hard sets, most of them not to failure, but let me tell you what, you might've been able to hang with me for a set or a session, but try stringing, you know, four, six weeks together of doing three to four squat sessions per week with two deadlift sessions per week, oh, it's hard. Been, four I bench sessions per week, years. the accumulation of that, but I got strong as fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? And right now, like I'm, I'm about 95% of the way back to my all time highest strength. And a lot of what just limits me is like, I don't have the same recovery capacity as I used to. Stay <laughs> Look at that. Problem solved. There you go. I mean, I mean, obviously that's not where you're going, but it, it, that's what I'm saying. Like at some point, like, dude, what if you, what if you just like, cause then you have, it, I, you know, there's another guy who's a powerlifting coach, my buddy, Joey and uh, Natty, his whole career, whole time. Joey flex. Like, yes. I love Joey. Good friend of mine. And I'm always like, yo, it's like, you've mastered it this way. Mm -hmm. You're mastering these things this way. It's like at some point, why not just master it the other way too? Then you're best of both worlds. Yeah, I but mean, then like you get you, you, your original guys are like, "You f cheater, you <laughs> suck." You know, I don't worry so much about that. I guess like for me, the decline at some point is inevitable, right? Yeah, and it's more about like how do you mentally approach that, right? Um, I'm not saying just like like. I'm not going to like go gentle into that good night. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, I'll just take it as it comes. Yeah. I get you know? it. I get it. And for me, it's like, this has been more, honestly, I love to compete. I love to push myself. Let's find something else to do. You know, yeah. I'll still train. I love to, I'll always love to train. Yeah. Um, and who knows? I mean, they got masters all the way up to 70 plus years old. So, yeah. Um, so let's talk about this, the idea, I guess, of steroids a little bit in general because I'm not, I'm not at all trying to say like people should just take and I and in fact I think nowadays on the internet and social media it's like really glorified and so much more talked about that it's like a good and a very bad thing because like yeah, you got a like, lot of young kids who are just like I talked about this before in another pod but like I've had a kid come up to me at my gym and be like how I'm like he comes up to me he goes should I take trend and I'm like how long have you been training for of like a year year and a half oh my god and I'm like what like what, what are you saying? Because it's so popularized yeah. because of the social media figures and, you know, this kind of shit. And I don't really know much about the individual compounds. Like I know generally about testosterone, you know, but, um, but like trend like, is like, trend would be like, from what I understand, on people, are like, people are like, trend is like the one that's the most powerful, but also yeah. with some pretty significant side effects. Exactly. And that's the thing is like, there's all, for every gimme, like, there's a gotcha. But it's like, know? why would you first question be like, should I take trend, dude? It's like, well, it's because, you know, when you're young, you want everything fast, yeah. you know, and um, you you see what, you know, some of the subculture is doing. Like, there's a pretty strong subculture. I mean, you, yeah. know, you had your Rich Pianas and you had, you know, Boston Lloyd. Um, yeah. They were kind of some of the people who were glorifying that stuff. And hey, like, I you know, I never knew Rich. Uh, Boston actually used to train at my the gym I was at in Tampa for a while. And seemed like a perfectly nice guy, you know. Um, but I mean, like, look what happened, yeah. you know, like, and I, I, I'm in no way saying they deserve that or anything like that, yeah, but like not. so many people it, you, with NFL combat sports are kind of the same, which is like, they're like, yeah, I, I know there's a cost, but I'm totally happy to pay it until it happens. Right. Like there's, you think when you're young, because you can't imagine not, we're so it's kind of like a narcissism almost like we're so like in how we feel in a moment. We just can't imagine it being different than that. You know, like think about when you're sad, it's hard to imagine feeling happy. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. And when you're having a great time, it's hard to imagine feeling sad. Like, I don't know. It's probably some survival mechanism we have. Right. But so when you're young and you feel strong and you're not having really any like negative effects that, you know, other than like, some acne and like whatever happens, um, you know, you go, yeah, 
yeah, I'm totally cool with like if it takes five years off my life. I'm probably going to feel differently when you're when you're at that time, right? Yeah. So I guess you know my thing is <clears throat> when it comes to steroids, I'm all about informed consent, right? Like understand this has you know there's trade offs here, right? Yeah. Um. And there's not probably a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people are like, listen, this is one thing I tell people these days. Like these days, it's not good enough to be just good at one thing. You got to be good at a couple things. Here's why. I don't care how jacked you are. Unless you're Mr. Olympia, somebody out there is more jacked than you. Right? Yeah. yeah. So if your thing is just, I'm jacked. Okay. Um, don't care how good looking you are. There's somebody out there that's probably better looking than you, right? Yeah. Don't care how great of videos you make. There's a lot of great video editors, right? Like you got to have something like, so for me, it's like, hey, there's funnier people. There's smarter people. There's stronger people. There's more jack people. Not a lot of people put all those things together like I do though, you know? Yeah. So just thinking, I think some of these kids are like, well, you know, this guy on social media I follow, he got real famous because, you know, he blew up and he was jacked. And it's like, yeah, but like, you know, like Rich Piana, he was a personality. Huge you know? personality. Whether you liked it or not. Yeah. Like you didn't, you didn't have like in between feelings about Rich Piana when you saw his stuff, right? Like you yeah, either yeah. loved him or you hated him, right? Yeah. Which is a great way to build a following because you're a personality, right? And so I think, you know, it, for younger guys... If you're going to do that stuff, all right. But understand, like, that is not going to be sufficient to, like, get you rich and famous, you yeah. know? And, um, you know, also consider that if you think, because this is why a lot of people start lifting, why I start lifting, I'm like, oh, if I was just looked like this, I would be happy. So... <laughs> Never some, and I'm sure you can, dude, some of the most. Oh, it's never enough. And I, I can tell you, like, some of the most miserable human beings yeah. I have ever met had f***ing incredible physiques. <laughs> like, so I, I'm like, yeah. listen. You're forever small, man. Forever small. But I, I tell people like, hey, I love lifting. You know, lifting may be more confident, may be more resilient, but not because of the physique and the strength I got. It's because lifting taught me resilience. It taught me consistency. It taught me how to work through setbacks. You yeah. know, like I learned all that stuff from lifting. And so then I was able to go and apply those lessons I learned to other aspects of life, you know, to stuff that was way harder, you know, like psychological stress, um, you know, losing businesses, um, all kinds of shit that was way harder than anything I ever dealt with at lifting, yeah. you know, but it, I wouldn't have had the confidence to take those things on if I hadn't had that experience through lifting. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I guess, you know, the, the big thing is like, Hey, if you want to do steroids, <clears throat> okay, cool. But like spend some time actually lifting without yeah. it. For you know? sure. You need to like spend some time just doing the work. Like, like some of these kids, it's like, bro, you're 18. Yeah. Like you don't even know what you can do. You yeah. don't know what you can do. And listen, like, you know, I'm not going to be one of those guys. You got to get to your natural max first. No, you don't have to do that. Um, but like spend some time learning the lessons that it's going to teach you before you put a supercharger on your, like learn how to drive a normal car before you go and throw a supercharger on it. Yeah. You burn out you the know? clutch because you don't know how to shift and exactly. shit properly. Exactly. So it's like, just, you know, just have a little bit of patience. You yeah. know, I think that's the one thing that age has taught me. Yeah. Is, you know, patience really can be a superpower, you know, when it comes to stuff like, especially in business, I've been around so many people like, we got to execute this right now. We got to go right now. And I'm like, hey, 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 like, hey, money ain't going nowhere. Let's make sure we do this right. You know, let's make sure we have our ducks in a row. Like, let's just, yeah, you know, take our time. So what do you and think? What do you, what do you think about? I kind of cut you off. Sorry. What do you think okay. about uh, Sam Sulik? Have you seen him? been blowing up. I've only seen what other people have said about it. Um, okay. From my understanding, he's a young guy who's taken a lot of steroids. 
Jackson. I don't. I don't know if he's saying a lot. I mean, okay. I have no idea. I oh. he's jacked and he's young and he's fucking blowing the fuck up because he posts like what what to me is what people posted like ten years ago, which is funny how things come back and all back to cycles where it's like everyone got tired of the hurrah. Look at this nice edit and all this. Shit. And it's just like this guy's like tripod. Look at me work really fucking hard and mm -hmm. take this shit real serious. Okay. So. Do I know about his steroid usage? I don't. Okay. I'd love to talk to him about it. But, like, yeah, you see what people say, right? They're, they're assuming because of, I think, his development at such a young age. Yeah. That he, My apologies then, Sam. I'm yeah, just, yeah, I don't like know. I said, I'm just reading from what other people I'm, say, I'm, right? I'm all, I mean, I'm, I'm certain he takes steroids. I'm, I don't know to what degree he takes them. Right. Um, but, you know, there's, there, it's just, it's, the, the thing's interesting. Like, his popularity is really interesting to me as far as, like, how fast it, like, went from zero to, like, millions yeah because of the content he makes well and that's the man I, I i'll tell you that's a whole nother issue wrapped up there i kind of this is gonna sound weird i kind of feel bad for him because can you imagine getting the kind of popularity you have now at like age 18 or 19 or something like be insane that? um yeah like i'm really glad that this has actually been a slow climb for me um because Typically, when young kids get a lot of popularity and money, it does not end very well. Because um, you just don't have the maturity to be able to handle that shit at such a young age. You know? Could be. You know, I talked to him on the phone. He, he got, he, apparently, he's going to school to get like an engineering degree. This guy's super smart. Great. And I, yeah. you know, I hope he's got you know, smart people in his ear. Because like, so like, it's so hard to like, stay centered. And but what I mean by that is... Hey, I've been guilty of reading my own hype and being like, yeah, like I'm the man, you know? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I've also been guilty of reading the negative shit and going, yeah, yeah. Fuck, maybe I am a piece of shit, you know? Like, oh, yeah. um, and so I think like over time I've gotten better about like, all right, you know, um, I need to be careful of how much of my hype I read. I need to be careful about how much of my negative stuff I believe, you know? Um, and I think that that just comes with time and experience. But when you're young, like you can take stuff so personal. You're still learning. You know, yeah. you're still learning. You're still, man, like sometimes I'm like, I don't really think like I even got close to emotionally maturing until I got in my like mid thirties, you know? Um, and just thinking about like, I was uh, like just a totally random different thing. But I'm like thinking about people who have kids when they're like 18 years old, like have a baby or something like that. I'm like, Oh my God. I couldn't imagine. Oh, I that. cannot imagine. Cause I have two kids and I know how fucking hard it was for me. And I felt like I was ready, you know? Um, so yeah, I would just like, hopefully he's got some like, you know, good support and it seems like um, he does. That's good. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, um, he's also seems to be like a very like lone wolf. Like I don't yeah. see him doing a lot of stuff with, Many people. Well, and that's the I thing think that's that, part of his allure, though, too. I mean, that's good. I mean, you just got to be... It's funny because, you know, you hear these kind of, like, um, touts or um, kind of cliche things of, like, you know, um, if you... It's lonely at the top or, um, you know, people will try to use you for different stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then it, and then it happened. You know? Oh, yeah. And it's like... I've been there. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, that's one of the things now is it's like, um, I have a tendency that like, I'll make friends too quick. You know what I mean? Like, I'll be like, oh, they're really nice and cool. And then I, thankfully, now I have people in my life who are like, mm -mm, you know, that act as my filter, you know, who are much more discerning. Because I kind of like everybody, like when I meet them and hang out, you know? Yeah. Um, But... You know, it got me in trouble quite a bit because it's like not everybody has your best interest at heart. And I don't even think it's necessarily like a nefarious thing all the time. It's just like if you bring somebody into your circle and they're getting certain things from it, if that goes away at some point, they're like, hey, that guy's not my friend anymore. And hmm. then you're left like, well, hang on. I thought we were friends because of a connection we have and like, you know, showing up for each other in terms of like listening and giving advice and all but you were just wanting this thing, you know? Um, yeah. And so I don't necessarily think it's a, a nefarious thing. There are people who are definitely nefarious and clout chasers for sure. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, 
it's one of those things where I tell people like, you know, I like my life. I wouldn't trade it, but there's ups and downs. You know, there's, there's trade-offs. There's no solutions, yeah. only trade-offs. So I guess for this kid, like, Hey man, just be careful and go slow. Yeah. You know, like if you're, if you're blowing up, say no to more stuff than you say yes to. That, yeah. That's that, good would advice. Be, that would be the first thing I would say. Like saying yes to too much will get you in a world of trouble real quick. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my biggest issues that I had going through, through it all was like, you think that everyone's going to have the same sort of like good in them that you have in you. You know what I'm saying? Well, like we, you want- we view other people through the prism of our own lens. Right. Yeah. And that's, I think that's one of the things people really struggle with, with, I don't know if empathy is the right word, but you have to understand that not everybody has the same life experiences as you or the same upbringing or whatever. And like, I remember I've, I've been around people who are very like, um, and somebody close to me who was like, it seemed like every person around them, they're like, well, what are they trying to get out of it? Or they're trying to do this to, to me or this trying. I'm like, what have they done that would make you think that? It's like, then they ended up kind of being a crappy person themselves. I'm like, oh, you think that because that's what you're doing, right? Like, yeah. that's your prism. Whereas, like, you know, typically people who are happier and a little more trusting, not saying all the time, there's always, you know, outliers and exceptions, but for the most part, people who have, like, a default, like, greater happy setting usually had a better upbringing. They trust people more, you know, they, because they also are not trying to like screw people over. So, I mean, that's one of the things, you know, I don't want to say fame cause it's just fitness fame, you know? Yeah. But kind of taught me is like, not everybody has the same perspective, right? What have you dealt with personally? Like that you're, you're speaking to, I mean, um, that you're comfortable sharing, obviously. Yeah. So, I think one of them would be like, um, uh, I started a company about seven years ago called Avatar Nutrition that um, is, it was a website. It's similar to my app Carbon, now Carbon Diet Coach, which is basically like an algorithm based coaching app. Um, it's done great. But Avatar was a website, but essentially it was algorithm based coaching. Um, and you know, it got really successful. Like we had, I think at the peak when I was kicked out of the company, we had 26,000 members. And originally it was me and another guy. We had 50-50 ownership. And um, then we brought in a registered dietitian because I thought it was important to have a registered dietitian. And she did do a lot of work for the company um, and was very critical. And the other person was like, hey, like we should give her some equity. Like, you know, she's done a lot of work. So we both gave up 10%. Well, then those two formed a personal relationship. Um, <laughs> and so though they had 60% of the company and, you know, they, they had their reasons. Like they, they, I think they became resentful of me because I was the face, even though they were kind of doing the day-to-day grunt work. Right. And but that's how shit works though. I, I was, you know, cause I'm looking at this, like, isn't it more important that I'm like bringing people into this? You know, and I think we when we did statistics, it was something like we did a branding experiment where it was like 70% of people were like brought to it by like directly by me. And it's probably higher than that because, um, you know, people also listed like social media as a way they found it. Well, what social media do you think they found it through, right? Right. So anyways, um, you know, I walk into a, a, what I think is a meeting one day and there's an attorney there and they, they're like, you're out. <laughs> and it was at the same time I was going through a personal divorce and their, their justification was um, that I had violated my fiduciary duty to the company, Um, which is a very nebulous term in Florida law. Um, But basically they were claiming that I was in competition with them because of my previous, my, my company I've had for 15 years, BioLane, you know, uh, which is my coaching company and before I even started working on Avatar, I'd started working on like a, uh, what, what we call a workout builder, which we still have, which is kind of like um, different workout programs on our website that are template based. They're, yeah. they're not algorithm based, but it is like somewhat flexible and modifiable. Um, and it's, it's done well for us and people love it. 
Um, but they were saying that that was in competition with what they were doing, even though they didn't have any training portion to their, you know, website. And I had been working on it from before I even started with them. Um, and then they actually sued me um, for that. Um, but it was all, okay, my opinion was the lawsuit was kind of a, um, just a kind of a bully tactic. It to was get a way me out. Because the, the negotiation would start with, well, here's what you're, we'll give you for your shares and we'll drop the lawsuit. And um, I was kind of like, no. It was just pushing you out. Pay me what my shares are worth. And then if you still feel like suing me, go ahead. Right? Yeah. Um, but that was all during the time where I was going through my first divorce. Um, I had like injured my back. I mean, it was a very rough time. And like, it got to the point where, I mean, like net worth wise, I was okay. But like I owed more money to attorneys than I could write a check for at the time. Yeah. You know, it was scary as fuck. And um, not to get too technical, but essentially my attorneys outmaneuvered their attorneys and I just had the facts on my side and um, ended up getting a, a fair buyout for my shares and they dropped the lawsuit. And, you know, um, I mean, they're still around to this day and no, like, hey, I'm I, like sincerely not mad about it. Um, because I don't even think, I, I don't think it was like their intention was to come in and eventually do this and kick me out. I think it, you know, kind of boiled down to a lack of communication. They had certain expectations that weren't communicated. I had certain expectations that weren't communicated. That's why kind of any relationship breaks down. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and it led me into other things that have been like way better. So I'm not mad at all about it. But it was kind of that first experience of like, but I thought you guys were my friends, you yeah. know, like I thought you guys like had my back, you know, and um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty rough time. Yeah. But, Fuck, I've definitely been there in so many ways. I mean, I, I think you, you talk to, you know, I, I was talking to my attorney about this. <clears throat> uh, I was like, you know, uh, yeah, you know, how do I protect against this in the future? He goes, don't have business partners. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. You know, now I will say, like, I have some really excellent business partners now. And I will say, like, good business partners. Oh, if I had, like, more of the good ones, I'd have 50 of them, you know, because yeah. good ones, like a good partnership, it relieves stress because they take over the stuff that you don't like doing. Like, at work, um, I have a business partner there, and he's phenomenal. Like, it, like I told him when we started this, I'm like, listen, I want to formulate and promote and that's it. I don't want to deal with logistics. I don't want to deal with shipping. I don't like customer, like none of that stuff. He's like, cool. I got that. And he's been great. Yeah. And we have great customer service. We have great, like he does a phenomenal job and allows me to do the stuff I'm good at. And we get along great. Yeah, so it's about finding the synergies where it works. It, it is. Sure. It is. And having, I mean, there was clear communication of expectations on the front end. You know, and yeah. I think that's a, a, a huge thing. Um, but yeah, you know, I've just had to learn that the hard way. So you, you said you had a kid that's that's uh, special needs. Yeah. What kind of special needs? Uh, he's on the autism spectrum. Okay. So my son, Robert, is 10 and he is uh, nonverbal. So he... Like nothing. Uh, he'll say mama, dada, okay. like that sort of thing. But... What is he? Is he really good at something though? I feel like they're always like really good at one thing. Um, yeah, like uh, he's a great swimmer. He loves the water. He's always in the water. Um, like pool is his therapy. Like yeah. he's really good at it. Um, but he's a great kid, and he like he can communicate. Like he has a, an iPad where he like picks different pictures and tells me what he needs. You know, it's intense. Yeah. So, um, and he's he's actually like in some ways he's difficult because like. Um, He's so quiet. He's kind of a, like, like, and if he finds something where he gets fixated on it, like any place we go, he'll find like a little toy or like one of his things is he always is holding like some small items in his hands. Always. He never doesn't have small items in his hands. And so I think it's like a soothing thing for him. And uh, so if we go in a store and it's got like, like little knickknacks or something like that, he'll like take off. Right. <laughs> and so, um, like if I'm out in public, it's like my head is always on a swivel because my daughter is the exact opposite. Livia is the loudest, most talkative human being. I mean, 
she's me. <laughs> it's like every time I start to complain about my daughter, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I don't know where she yeah. got that from. Yeah. Um, but she's like so demanding of my time because she wants so much interaction that it's like tough for me to also pay attention to Robert. So my head's like constantly on a swivel. So when we're home, he's super easy because he kind of does his own thing, you know, um, which actually I have had to make a, make a more concerted effort to like make sure that I spend one-on-one -on -one time with him because Liv will just monopolize my time, not intentionally, like yeah, not trying to do it against Robert, but if I don't like make it a point to like spend some time with my son, you know, um, but he's a great kid. He's happy, you know, what else can I ask for? Yeah, for sure. Does he, is you think he's going to get into working out or, um, I don't know. Give some dumbbells. Liv, Liv, is, you know Liv is actually into working out now. Oh, sh um, she's, she's seven and she deadlifted 71 pounds. That's her PR right now. Um, you teach her how to do it. Yeah. Hey, that's cool, yeah. man. I want kids, bro. Yeah. That's what I want. I mean, it's, it's very challenging. I mean, her, her attention span is like nanoseconds, you know? So trying to get her to like focus is tough, but she grew up on the phones and sh she has, um, uh, an iPad and I really try to limit that screen time. Um, but I will be fighting against her having a phone as long as possible. Yeah. I mean, if you re if you listen to like mental health experts, they're like delay it as long as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, it makes sense nowadays. Man. I mean, it's scary too, because like, yeah. you know, I used to put my kids on my Instagram a lot more cause it's like, it's just, it's, you know, I never realized like <clears throat> my Instagram is actually a business now. You know, yeah. before it was just my life, you know, and, you know, I had people start making comments about my kids. Like I've had people make comments about my son deserved to get autism because I got him vaccinated, you know, <laughs> or like I gave my son autism or like whatever it was. I don't think that's how autism uh, works. No, it's not how it works. <laughs> um, you know, I've had people make comments about, you know, my kids in other ways as well. Just like really nasty, you know. Fuck. Uh, to me, which by the way, if you do that to another human being, like I don't care how much I dislike somebody, I would never. They gotta be little kids though. Man. Those can't exactly. be adults. No, mm, I it mean, can't be adults, unless though. they're Russian bots. You know, that's also possible. Yeah, it just can't be an adult. Uh, I think people. Yeah, I don't know. I think when people can't get a reaction they're looking for, they they love some people level it up. You know, they level up the hate comments. Um, but like, <clears throat> I always just say like, yo, I appreciate the love, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you're getting me engagement out of the way. Appreciate the you love. Know? You're getting engagement. Like you're I'll get DMs. I, you know, I've talked about this before, but like I get the nastiest DMs and then the middle I'll be like, yo, man, I really appreciate the love. Like, thank you. They'll switch up real fast. <laughs> oh, bro. I love you, man. So I was like around yeah. I didn't need my last DM. I should do more of that. Fuck you, you fucking loser. Bitch, mother. <laughs> Dude, I've had it. It's so funny. Like every once to like, I don't get to all my DMs, but I do try to like, you know, go through. I like. Really, I love reading my DMs. Uh, going through as much as I can, but it's so funny. Like you'll see, like, "Hey man, huge fan." You know. Love oh that yeah, video. yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, "Fuck you, you motherfucker!" <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, just going through the Rolodex, trying to get attention. Dude. You know? But something, you know, my daughter. I've been. I still put them on my Instagram, but it's it's much less, and it's usually just in stories. Yeah. But like. <clears throat> We did something, and, and Livia's like, you should post that. And I'm like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, and she, how old is she? She's seven. Dude. And she's also had the experience of being out with dad, who's just dad, but see people come up to me as fans, right? I remember the first time this happened, I was uh, taking her to see Frozen, like the play, the musical, and get out of the car, and somebody stops me, like, oh, I love your stuff. Like, I lost 40 pounds doing, you know, this and this. And I was like, oh, you know, thank you really for, can, I, can we take a picture? I'm like, yeah, you know, I just got my daughter with me. So if we could just be quick, you know? Um, so we took a picture and they walked off and Livia looks at me and she's like, I think she was five. And she goes, daddy, what just happened? And I'm like, oh, like some people know me cause you know, I do stuff that, you know, people follow. But now like, <clears throat> as I've gotten more popular, like we were at the Florida aquarium the other, um, the other week and I probably got stopped like four or five times, you know? And so I'm seeing like now she's starting to realize like, oh, dad is known by a lot of people. And so saying that I'm like, oh, man, she doesn't realize like what the ramifications of some of this stuff are, you know. 
So I've I've really She's like, um, tag me. Yeah, tag me. Yeah. <laughs> no way. No, I um, you know, so it's like I don't know. Some of this stuff, you know. I do worry about that kind of that's that's part of the worry of having just having kids in general. Is it's like scary, this, man. the way this is going. I'll tell you, you will never sleep the same after you have kids. And not even because they wake you up. Because there's just always this like low level anxiety of worry, you know, like you just never, even now, like they're with my, 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 my ex-wife, uh, Isabel. Um, it's like, I'm always thinking like, I hope everything is okay. You know, whatever. Like, fortunately we have pretty good communication and we like keep each other updated and stuff. And so like, you know, if I ever want to talk to the kids, I can always FaceTime them or whatnot. Um, but it is like, it's so scary, but it's also like you have to embrace it in some ways. Cause like you can't control everything around them forever. Yeah. You know, you got to hope that like you can give them enough tools that when they're all teenagers are going to be heads and up, yeah, you know, for sure. you just hope they fuck up small enough that it's something they learn from and grow from it as opposed to some like really serious shit. Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, that's when I think about having kids, like I know that like people got to learn at their own pace. Like, dude, it's, it's funny even like talking to some of these like up and coming like streamers and influencers in the space. Cause I, I tend to interact with a bunch of these guys. It's like seeing how, like how serious they take all this stuff. Cause it's serious. Cause it's like, it's a, they get these big audiences so fast and it, there's a lot of pressure that comes along with it. And like, like, I feel like people always, obviously, naturally, humans always want to just make the right moves and like do the right thing and like for themselves or make the best move possible. But like, it's also just not realistic to to do it all right and never make mistakes. It's just literally yeah. not going to happen. I am. Um, this is more an entrepreneurship stuff, but I, I heard um, a quote. I think it was from Mark Zuckerberg. And they were asking him, what mistakes should young entrepreneurs avoid? And his response was something I'll never forget. He goes, don't even bother trying to yeah. avoid mistakes. Just be ready to learn from them and pivot quickly. You yeah. know? And I think that's the, like, mistakes are fine. Like, that's actually where you learn most of your shit, right? Like, if you don't make mistakes, you're never going to learn anything, right? Like, you're, if you don't make mistakes, you should be a really jacked billionaire, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you got everything figured out, you know? Um, it's... I think the biggest thing is like you just start walking the path. And that's I, uh, my one motivational speech I've ever given as a keynote was the, I don't have a title for it, but my kind of crux of it is perfectionism and paralysis by analysis has killed way more dreams than failure ever has. Yeah. They're because, like the same fucking thing because you never start. Yeah. You know, like so many people are just scared to start because they want like everything lined up, whether it's entrepreneurship or right. you see this with people like overanalyze every detail of lifting or nutrition. It's like, dude, just go. Yeah. Like just go hard and consistent. And yeah, you're going to screw up some. You're going to fuck it up and just pay attention when you fuck it up as to why you fucked it up. Right. And then you can go back and course correct. And over time you get better. Right. I think that's a lot of the reasons why my social media has gotten so much better in terms of like being able to acquire more of a following because I've just paid attention to what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. You know, um, same thing with lifting. It's like, OK, that worked. That didn't work. Do more of this. Right. Yeah. Same thing with entrepreneurship. OK, this shit worked. This shit didn't seem to work. So we're going to do more of this. Like, just pay attention. I think. But too many people get ego wrapped up in that as well, where it's like they get so invested in something that has to work, right? Yeah. That they don't, it's like the sunk cost fallacy. They don't know, like, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Yeah. And, uh, but you can only learn that through experience. So you just, sometimes you just got to go. That's it, man. That's fucking perfect. That's how we end the pod right there. There you go. That was fucking perfect, man. You crushed it. <laughs> fucking great meeting you, man. For yeah, real. Yeah, you Especially too, Especially first time because I've I've known about you for fucking years. 
Like a long, well, I don't long know if time. you remember. We met, actually met at 2015 Olympia. I must have been drunk. <laughs> you were. It was <laughs> no you, and, uh, you and Mike. Uh, oh, AKA. I was definitely drunk. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Whoa. So we were, I was at a, I think it was the Wind Nightclub, actually. Oh, it I was, was for sure it drunk. It was after party. Yeah, yeah. Holy I got. I think I've still got the picture, actually. Holy so. Fuck, dude. Oh, that was funny. Oh, man. I'm, I'm definitely drunk. I apologize, dude. You fucking crushed it. You're fucking, you're brilliant, man. I think you're really fucking smart. And and again, like, I've I've watched your stuff over the years. I've taken a lot from it. I've learned a lot from it. So thank you for coming and, and sitting down with me for real. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So everyone, you know, subscribe. Uh, every Tuesday at 11, we're on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, everywhere, uh, Apple iTunes, whatever. Anyways, and, and check <laughs> out your stuff. Uh, tell them where they can find you. Yeah, so... Uh, my Instagram is my digital business card. You yep. can find me at BioLane, and I'm at BioLane on most platforms. I sell everything in the fitness industry pretty much. I mean, I've got a supplement line, Outwork Nutrition. I've got yep. my app I talked about, Carbon Diet Coach. Um, you know, algorithm-based nutrition coaching. That I mean, we've had people lose over 100 pounds, and we've had people win pro cards in bodybuilding or physique stuff um, using the app, and it's less than 10 bucks a month. Um, we also do offer one-on-one coaching through my team of coaches, team BioLane. And um, I've got like the workout builder, like I talked about on my website, BioLane.com. And we have a research review. So if you're somebody who like wants to learn more about stuff, but you don't really know how to break the research stuff down yourself, I, we kind of break it down and put it in layman's terms so that you can learn like what the studies really say rather than what the headlines are saying. Yeah. And then I also have like courses for people who want to learn how to become coaches. I have a, um, a mentorship program with uh, Professor Bill Campbell that we created. It's basically the equivalent of a college degree and how to get people jacked <laughs> in terms of like oh, build yeah. muscle, burn fat. It's called Physique Coaching Academy. And it's uh, that's actually something I'm really proud of. That's really phenomenal. So, yeah, that's kind of uh, all cool. the shit I sell Thank and you. the full gamut. And uh, yeah, man, appreciate you having me Absolutely, on. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, brother. Good to see you.